morning. Good morning, welcome to the African American Legacy in Gardening and Horticulture. It's a pleasure to see you all and the opportunity to share today. And so what we will have to now is the processional of the North Carolina Federation of Gardeners, Gardening Clubs, I'm sorry. And we'll have their state song with the procession Oh, beautiful for garden green, sung by Allison Kalu. Good morning. morning and welcome again. Right now we'll have uh, Stephanie Fennell, Deputy Director of Durham County Library. Good morning. The mission of Durham County Library is to encourage discovery, connect the community, and lead in literacy. We are able to achieve this mission with the dedication and hard work of all of our staff and community partners. Today we have over 10 community partners who have helped make this event possible. Just to name a few, the Durham Library Foundation, Duke Gardens, and the Haytai Heritage Center. On behalf of Durham County Library, I want to say welcome and thank you for your continued support. And we're now going to receive remarks from William Lefebvre, Executive Director of the Sarah P. Duke Gardens. Welcome and good morning, everyone. It has been a privilege for Duke Gardens to be able to co-sponsor this symposium, the African American Legacy in Gardening and Horticulture. During the presentations today, we're going to hear stories that have not been shared enough. 
and as a white male who's come to know a thing or two about privilege over the decades, it's also time for me to take a seat, listen, learn, and grow. And that I will. Thank you for being here today, and thank you to everyone who labored long and hard to make this day possible. Thank you. Next up, we'll have Dr. Antoine Alston, who's the Associate Dean of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at North Carolina A&T State University. Good morning, colleagues. On behalf of Chancellor Martin, I'd like to bring you greetings from North Carolina A&T, and you're proud to my uh, Central Eagles out there. So good morning, esteemed colleagues, guests, scholars, community leaders, and garden enthusiasts. I am deeply honored to stand before you today to open this vital symposium on the heritage of African Americans in gardening and horticulture, with a brief highlight on the mo monumental contributions of North Carolina A&T State University to this rich tradition. As the son of an ag teacher out of Northern Ash High School in Rocky Mountain, my hometown, horticulture is deeply rooted in my, in my veins. In the tapestry of American history, the threads woven by African Americans in the realms of gardening and horticulture are vibrant and enduring. These practices are not just about cultivating plants, they are about cultivating community, knowledge, and profound connection to the earth that sustains us all. It is a legacy that has nourished bodies, spirits, and minds bridging generations. North Carolina with its lush landscapes and fertile soil has been a significant backdrop to this history. It's here that African American gardeners and horticulturists have played a pivotal role in shaping not only the physical environment, but also the cultural and social fabric of our communities. The knowledge, resilience, and innovation have enriched our collective understanding of the natural world. At the heart of this story is North Carolina A&T State University in the College of Agriculture and Environmental Science. As a beacon of education, research, and cooperative extension in the agriculture, North Carolina A&T has been instrumental in advancing the field of gardening and horticulture. It has provided a platform for African American students and professionals to lead, innovate, and excel. The university's programs and initiatives have not only contributed to the scientific and practical advancements in the field, but have also been a vital force in uplifting the community and preserving the cultural heritage of African American garden and horticulture. Today we gather not only to celebrate this rich heritage, but also to engage in meaningful dialogue about the future. We stand on the shoulders of giants. As we look forward, we are inspired by the legacy to continue nurturing the land and our communities with wisdom, passion, and resilience. Let us use this symposium as a fertile ground for ideas, collaboration, and growth. May our discussions be as enriching as the soil we cherish and as vibrant as the gardens we cultivate. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. And as I always say to all my eagles again, Aggie Pride. <laughs> And next, we have to give remarks, Joanne Massey Lalikas, who is the Director of Learning and Engagement at the North Carolina Botanical Garden. Good morning. It's an honor and privilege to stand before you this morning in place of Damon Waite, the Director of the North Carolina Botanical Garden, which is located in Chapel Hill. He was unfortunately taken away for a family emergency, and I'm grateful to be in, in his place this morning. And Damon had planned to give honor to the esteemed supercentenarian and gardening superpower in the room this morning, Ms. Catherine Farrell. Ms. Farrell was born in 1912 and was ahead of her time in understanding the reparative and regenerative qualities of gardens and beautiful landscapes. And Damon had pulled a quote from one of his gardening mentors from the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, where he worked in Texas. Claudia Alta, Lady of Bird Johnson, the first lady of the United States from 1963 to 69, who was known for her national gardening and beautification projects. This quote is from the White House Diary, 
1967 speech at Yale University and seemed prescient for the conversations today. The environment, or gardens as you will, is where we all meet, where we all have a mutual interest. It is the one thing all of us share. It is not only a mirror of ourselves, but a focusing lens on what we can become. With that, I'd like to also say thank you to Carter Q for inviting the North Carolina Botanical Garden to be a part of this event. And I'm honored to be here with you all and look forward to learning with you all here today. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, before we move into the panel portion of it, I would like to acknowledge the North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs. Uh, with us today we have, please excuse me, Odessa Patrick of the Begonia Garden Club, Greensboro, North Carolina, Donna Mack, Lion Park, Lion Park Rose Garden Club here in Durham, North Carolina, Laura Alston Dudley, which is the Gala Lily Garden Club in Lewisburg, North Carolina. If you'll bear with me a moment, uh, my glasses are not working as they should, and I'm gonna use this wonderful technology to enhance it so we can limit the mumbling and the bumbling. <laughs> we have Sarah Lene with Nature Lovers Garden Club out of Oxford, North Carolina. Barbara Carroll, Daisy Garden Club, Henderson, North Carolina. And representing the year-round garden club in Durham, North Carolina is Joe Williams. Representing the Little Garden Club here in Durham, North Carolina is Annetta Green. And representing the Old Fashioned Garden Club out of Lewisburg, North Carolina is Maddie Mann. Now, can we give these wonderful clubs and institutions a hand? Thank you. So at this point, I'll bring Rebecca Bobbitt up to introduce Fantastic. Hello, everyone. Good to see everybody's beautiful face this morning. My name is Rakaya Bobbitt. I'm a landscaping architect student over in um, North Carolina A&T University. Like you said, Aggie Fry. <laughs> Today I have the honor to introduce our presenters. We're gonna start off with our moderator, Derek, the chocolate, the chocolate botanist Haynes. Um, he walks in the footsteps of African-American plant researcher, George Washington Carver and Percy Julian, a trained botanist with a background in plant biology. Our other presenter is Betty Jenkins. She is a flower designer, um, worked in Chapel Hill for over four, 40 years with um, flower design. And she was raised by her grandmother, Ada Edwards, one of the original flower ladies of Chapel Hill. Our next presenter is Justin Robinson, a Grammy Award winning musician and vocalist, a cultural preservationist and historic food ways expert. He is a member of the Earth Seed Land Corporation here in Durham. Um, and our next one is Cheryl Gibson, the proprietor of Vine and Branch, a small boutique flower farm in Durham, North Carolina, where she grows specialty cut flowers and sells wholesale to local florists and wedding designer. Thank you so much, enjoy. And we have an error on my part but we are gonna to continue to keep this program rolling. We're gonna have Durham County Commissioner, Netta Alam. Fantastic, great, good to see you. She's gonna, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Netta Alam. I'm the chair of the Durham County Board of Commissioners. And please bear with me, as much as we love this pollen for our gardening, it has not been kind to my voice. I'm absolutely delighted that so many of you have joined us today for this very special event, the African-American Legacy in Gardening and Horticultural Symposium 
On behalf of our board of commissioners and staff, I'm honored to welcome each of you to this outstanding celebration. We welcome also those of you who are present in this great facility and those who have joined us virtually from many locations this morning. I want to give a special thanks to Mr. Carter Q for this wonderful invitation. To and for also the many hats that he wears, one of which is as our unofficial Durham historian, that he brings so many important facts about Durham's history and events to our Board of Commissioners and City Council as well. I want to acknowledge also your North Carolina Federation President, Ms. Ms. Gloria Phoenix. And we are here as a community to celebrate the African American legacy in gardening and horticulture, but indeed this is also the perfect time to celebrate our beloved Miss Catherine Farrell. I know you will join me in a round of applause honoring her. <laughs> Miss Farrell is so special. At 111 years of age, she is an enduring example of how gardening should be practiced for stress reduction and to help with lifelong fitness. And while we also honor Ms. Farrell as our state's and Durham's, I don't want to say oldest resident, I'll say most experienced resident, know that she is also both an ornamental gardener and longtime member of the Better Homes and Garden Club and the North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs. At our Board of Commissioners meeting this past Monday evening, I actually had the honor of declaring this week Catherine Farrell Beautification and Garden Week. And I have this proclamation with me, and I am pleased to read it at this time. I'll join Ms. Farrell down here. Durham Board of County Commissioners Proclamation, Catherine Farrell Beautification and Garden Week 2024. Whereas Catherine Farrell, North Carolina's oldest citizen and ornamental gardener, has beautified Durham's green spaces and private homes with flowers, shrubs, and trees. And whereas Catherine Farrell, as a long-standing member of the North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs and Durham affiliate chapter Better Homes and Garden Club, has epitomized horticultural excellence and community services. And whereas, Catherine Farrell has promoted civic pride and human kindness through gardening and love of the environment for future generations of North Carolinians. And whereas, Catherine Farrell promotes gardening as a means of healthy living, stress reduction, and lifelong fitness. And whereas, Catherine Farrell has advocated for the importance of all creatures, large and small, that share our planet and worked to make a difference in the world's overall ecological betterment. And whereas Catherine Farrell has empowered Durham area residents and garden clubs across the state and nation to make a difference in the communities where they reside and work. Now therefore, I, Nida Alam, chair and on behalf of the Durham Board of County Commissioners, do hereby proclaim March 25th through March 31st, 2024 as Catherine Farrell Beautification and Garden Week in Durham County. This the 25th day of March 2024. Nidha Alam, Chair of Durham Board of County Commissioners. Thank you so much. Again, I and the whole board are so honored to present this proclamation to Ms. Farrell. Please know how much you are loved, respected, and appreciated for your wonderful life and legacy of service to others. As I continue this morning, we certainly appreciate all the contrib contributions made by members and friends of the North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs and its affiliates. Additionally, our Board of Commissioners proclaimed today, March 30th, 2024, 
as North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs Day in Durham County. I would also like to read that and present this proclamation to Ms. President Ms. Gloria Phoenix and your local officers. Would you please come forward as I read this proclamation? The Durham Board of County Commissioners Proclamation, North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs Day 2024. Whereas the North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs was founded in 1935 on the campus of NCANT University with Asa Sims as advisor and Maddie Hall Zuma as its first president. And whereas the North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs and its affiliated clubs across North Carolina have fostered community beautification, cultural awareness, horticultural ex excellence, and ecological understanding. And whereas the achievements and efforts of the North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs has increased the plant and ecological knowledge of K through 12 students and North Carolina residents in general, and promoted civic pride and environmental responsibility in youth populations, and whereas many past and present Durham area residents have held membership in the North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs, had have enhanced the Federation's mission throughout the state with their time and talents, and whereas the work of the North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs has extended beyond gardening to aiding and supporting or numerous organizations and efforts socially and economically, now therefore I, Nida Alam, and on behalf of the Durham Board of County Commissioners, do hereby proclaim March 30th, 2024, as North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs Day in Durham County, North Carolina. This, the 25th day of March, 2024, Nida Alam, Chair. Thank you so much for your host. Again, my sincere thanks for all you do for our community and beyond. Enjoy the friendship and fellowship of your wonderful organization and best wishes for an insightful and productive symposium today. Thank you so much for having me this morning. It's been an honor and please enjoy the rest of your day. Great. Thank you. Back on track and thank you. And Ms. Fennell, thank you so much for showing us what the possibilities are. Not everyone gets to that point. Thank you so much that we can see what the true possibilities are. Wonderful. Wonderful to meet you. Thank you very much. ready to begin the panel. Hello everyone, I am Derek the Chocolate Botanist. It is good to see you all. How are y'all doing? <laughs> this is great and phenomenal. So we have an awesome panel that is gonna be happening. I'm gonna read and tell you about the panel. So we're gonna see how good I can multitask. Okay, don't judge too hard, there we go. So this is gonna be the first session of the day and this is gonna be such an awesome occasion. So this is the Afroecologies Ethnobotanical Healing Farm Foodways and Floor Culture in Black Southern Landscapes panel. And we have some awesome panelists that you have heard about earlier today. So you, we are going to be talking about innate knowledge and experiential learning that we as black folks have in relation to plants. This could be anything that is medicinal, anything that is spiritual, anything that is entrepreneurial, or anything that just centers us and relates us to gardening, right? In addition to connecting us with our elders. So in this wide ranging conversation, the panelists will discuss and deconstruct Afro ancestral plant wisdom, methodologies used for human sustenance, mind body healing, birth and death rituals, business economic models, and environmental beautification 
in Malou of the Black Belt South and larger African diaspora settings. So with that being said, we're gonna have our panelists come up. We have Miss Betty Jenkins, Mr. Justin Robinson, and Cheryl Gibson. Thank you, thank you. Let's keep that round of applause going as they come. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that clap, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. That's right, so we're gonna ask these panelists a couple of questions that I have prepared at the end. When we have around 10 minutes left, you'll be able to ask some of your questions and we'll go from there. So I have some questions I typed up on my phone. And the first is, as we have these awesome people who have such diverse experiences up here, including myself, I want us to consider this, right? Think about this question. There are, or there exists a generational gap in relate, as it relates to plants and gardening, right? That generational gap is due to a lot of reasons, and you can go into that in your answer. But how can we all, from your point of view, encourage younger generations to reconnect with nature, to reconnect with that traditional plant knowledge as they can, sustainable farming, gardening, floriculture, whatever plants mean to you, okay? How can we connect them to go back with that? So Ms. Ms. Bet, I think your, your hand moved first. Are you ready? You got my answer for me? Your hand, moved, your hand went up. We'll go to Justin first. Justin, Justin, give me that answer. Um, I, th I think um, we actually have to be there with them, like we have to, encourage them to be there with us. Um, and it has to be important in their lives, right? Because we're competing with so many other things. I mean, there most people don't know anything about plants. Um, and as we've moved into the internet age and the AI age and whatever, there's, there's not real reasons to be out there, right? So we have to make it important for them, like to know that our food, our medicine, our, our fiber, all these things are coming from plants, but it has to be real for their lives. Like how do you make, like this weekend, I'm making, we're me and my daughter are gonna try to make wisteria jelly, Ooh. right? She's excited because it's sugar, <laughs> right? Um, and so if it turns out well, we'll make it with the rest of the kids, right? And so it has to be important to them. Now she's five, so that's easy, but how is it, that's, that's the best time to sort of start cultivating, like we get things that are important to us from these sort of nature spaces. Okay, good answer, good answer. So we're gonna come to you last. We're gonna come to you last. I know you're excited. Okay, <laughs> your answer, Ms. Cheryl. Um, I would say, just from my own experience with my kids who are older, they are uh, young adults, um, I think that they have learned from watching me out in the garden that, that the garden is a place for healing, but not just um, a physical healing, but like a mental <laughs> healing. I mean, when I am out in my garden, there is no stress, <laughs> there is no tension, there's no I have to get this done by this time. There is just tranquility <laughs> and there is peace. And so when I can coax them to come out with me, they find the same thing. I mean, there's a lot vying for their attention these days. There's social media, they have peer pressure, they all have jobs now and they are very busy people. But I think what they have learned is that being out in nature, getting their hands in the soil, doing this work with plants, it brings about just a healing and a time when they can just stop and just be and not have to do. 
And so they find it refreshing and they actually get rejuvenated from being out in nature. So I think by showing young people that this is just a space where you can just come and relax and not have to perform or be anything, <laughs> then they will gravitate, I think, back to the garden. Ooh, phenomenal, phenomenal. And last but certainly not least. <laughs> um, I would say, going from my own experience, I have one son who's 35 years old, but he was with me as I was thought doing flowers, not in the beginning, but later on, uh, and he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it. He, he struggled, and I, I let that go. I didn't count it as a failure. But when he got older and he had children of his own, he said, now, Mama, I want you to teach my daughter how to do flowers. Well, how did I skip over him? <laughs> he didn't say a thing about him. But he want me to teach his daughter, who is just now only three years old. You know, that's a long time down the road. And then he saw the benefit. He saw the, the standing, the development of character, development. I, I was able to uh, develop a lot in me that, that I wouldn't have if I didn't have the flowers as ministering to me back then. You know, I'm 78 years old now, but I, when I started out making flowers, I was, it was, I was made to do it. You all go to the field, pick these flowers, so I can go into the city and sell them. And it wasn't a made in a harsh way. It was made in a way that those flowers was our bread and our butter. We never went hungry. That flower, what little bit she sold on that street, supplied children and grandchildren. You know, old people used to collect children, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> <laughs> they used to collect children. If you were already there, you would say, well, why is she taking somebody else? Well, she took me. Why shouldn't she take somebody else? But uh, what I'm saying, but just keep, we had to just keep working with them. I, I've trained a lot of people how to do it. But I show it, show them how beneficial it'd be. Whatever personality you have, you can make a flower and come out beautiful. And that 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 builds up your encouragement. That builds up your faith that you can do something. Because when I started out, I didn't have the faith. But I kept working with it. And I kept working. I was telling you yesterday, I closed my business two times and started up the third time but I never thought I wasn't gonna make it. And that's what the young people's gotta see. They gotta see people's being real and honest. It didn't, you just don't get in business and fly. No, you're gonna have some failures. I failed, closed out everything. Because it was inside of me, I had to go back. Because my grandmother raised me. I never lived with my mother. I always stayed with my grandmother. I was telling them I was born by a midwife and so from that day, I never left my grandmother's house until I left the state. So you have to know those things are embedded in us. A lot of you here have some things in you probably embedded in you that you could go, if you had to, would you go back to do it? Yes. I went back to flowers. And I'm still doing flowers. It's over 40 years now. So that's a long time. My son lived next door to me. And my son sees that. I've stood the test. You, gotta, you have to stand the test to tell young people that they can do it. That's why they don't have faith in us because if we're not doing it, we want them to do something that we're not doing. I feel the test. I, I, I feel I, I, I understanding when it's not right is hard. It's hard, but you still have to stand. And my grandmother always had a smile on her face selling those flowers. She never brought many back home. Now, I didn't say she sold them all. <laughs> <laughs> she brought them back home. Sometimes she gave them away. That's a form of advertisement. And they get on me all the time. The, the ladies over here work with me. 
She probably gave that to him. What she told me yesterday, why they come to see you? Because they want a cut and they found. <laughs> That's why they come to you. I said, well, it's advertisement. And it's showing that someone cares. That flower is occurring something. I have compassion. You learn compassion in making flowers. Compassion. That flower depends on us. You know, so plants depend on us. So young people will come along if we have the patience to impart in them what was imparted in us. You know, it's impartation. We stop in part. I'm up. You knew I wanted to finish. So I think that young people will come because I've had people to come and I've trained them. They got their, they had their own business but they came back to want to add flowers to their business. You know, not just in this state, in other states, you know. And so you have to be willing to share. Share truth, though. To try that, yeah, I've been down, but I'm up. You got you to gotta share that. Because if we look at people, we think, boy, I want to go where they go, as if it's an easy selling thing. You got to tell them about the, the, the hills you had to climb. There were some hills we have to climb. That's where the young people is looking for. The realness of people today. The realness to say, yeah, I made it, but let me share some things. I, I didn't stop making flowers and go out of business because I couldn't make flowers. There were some components in my setting up I didn't have. One was money. <laughs> One was definite money, <laughs> and I had a little, but God helped me. It's inside of me. It's not outside. It's inside, and I'm looking forward for more young people's catching on, catching on to the beauty. It is a, I can go make a flower, and I come to a piece. I can be upset about something way over there, but that flower, I don't have a thing against this flower. Mm. Not one thing against this flower, and I can make it, and I can present it to somebody that is going to cheer them up. I don't care how sad the occasion. I promise you I can make them change. Well, I love that. Thank you. <laughs> you know, you. I appreciate that. That is phenomenal. So you said a lot of, you said a lot of great things in that that I wanted to jump on and a lot of uh, great seeds to keep this conversation going. So one of them that you said was that the, something to the effect of the plants minister to you, right? And plants, in whatever form or shape that we enjoy them, can be a spiritual experience for them. Can you jump a little bit into what the plants mean to you and how they relate to you spiritually? Spiritually, it shows me, in the, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth and everything. And when he finished, he said, it was good. Mm -hmm. So those flowers, it was good. So. They've been through generations and still reproducing. You understand? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that, that spiritually, I know it, it'll keep moving. Inside me, whatever I need to do, it ha if it don't show up inside of me, I had to go back to bed and wake up another day. Because <laughs> I didn't get it. I, I missed it some <laughs> kind of way. <laughs> that's the reason that in spiritually it helps me because of what's in me. The older one, if you would express how you got help. My grandmother was a strong lady. Mm -hmm. She had many, many children. She had, I know, 17 boys yeah. and three girls. <laughs> but by the time I came along, she, they were gone. I was the new generation of hired help to live. <laughs> it was hired help to live, you know. It wasn't hired help to make money, because mm -hmm. no money was ever changed. But I had a roof over my head, had food on the table. I was healthy. And so all of that came with her self, uh, self, helping herself to sell those flowers, staying strong, and showing forth love. She taught us all the right thing, not that I followed it to the T. You, but the words say, raising up, they should go. They'll come back. She allowed that to happen. She said, do what you do, but come back. You, I had something to come back to. Those flowers, 
that she sold on the street. I was hoping I could bring some brochures. I didn't have enough of them. She had all kinds of fiber. They used 10 cans to take them to town and put it in them. But Peoples and Chopper Hill bought those flowers, and I'm sure she gave away plenty. What's the need of bringing a flower back home and it's going to die? Wouldn't it be better to just give it to somebody, cheer somebody up? That's what I said. She, I'm, I can't tell you she sold every one of them, okay? And we out there, and that we, we didn't have most of our picking up flowers at my younger years. Well, we pass by a lot and where they have flowers. Have you passed down roads and you see beautiful flowers on the side of the road? Oh, such beautiful flowers. And we, we are stopping, go back there. I want you youngers, she said, go back, you go to that place, there's some flowers there. <laughs> and we did. So spiritually, my upbringing was strength. She never complained mm -hmm. about us. We was another generation to come along to help her. And I enjoyed that. So spiritually, it mm -hmm. has always helped me. Well, amen to the help. We love that. We love that. Justin, same question. Plants, connectivity, how do they connect to you or you connect to them spiritually in a spiritual sense? Oh, uh, okay. Um, well, I... I'm a dyed in the wool plant person. I like to say that I bleed green. Um, I come from a long line of plants, people. Um, like you, I learned from my grandfather, um, my mother's father, who had the most beautiful gardens, and he taught me. Um, he taught me how to like attract hummingbirds and that you always needed water in your garden, and he had the most ingenious solutions to things. Um, he would he would redirect the washing machine water into the garden. Now we call that gray water systems, right? <laughs> but my grandfather was doing this way back when. He's like, you don't need that water, but the plants do, right? Um, and so from us, from my relation, my sort of spiritual relationship with plants is that uh, I find, uh, you mentioned this earlier, plants don't have a negative agenda, right? Um, and in the Yoruba tradition, uh, there's an oracle associated with plants. And you can't go to the oracle if you have a double heart. So if you have uh, any deception in there, you, you can't even go to the plant oracle. Okay? So plants, I like to think about plants as guileless. They don't try to deceive you. They don't try to tell you anything they're not. They are just there to do their own things, and we get to share in it. And so... I don't want to get too deep into this in this panel, but um, plants have helped me in so many different ways to like clear up things in relationships. Um, and that is just from the plant living. When we start talking about take ingesting plants like as, er as herbal things, right? Open up more and more dimensions about what plants, how plants can help us. Um, so every time I'm outside, which is literally every day, rain or shine, I feel the connection with plants. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Same question. Plants, spirituality, how do you connect with them or they connect with you? Um, well, when I was growing up as a small child, my grandmother had a small patch of flowers on my grandparents' farm. And I remember helping her plants, flowers, and just tend to the garden. And it was just a wonderful time of sharing with my grandmother. But then I grew up, and I moved away, got married, had kids. And even though I loved flowers and having nice flowers in the yard, I didn't really have that connection that I have now. Um, it wasn't until my youngest child graduated from high school and went to college. And then I was kind of um, sort of an empty <laughs> nester, I guess. And I, I, was, I just remember thinking one day, okay, what am I supposed to do with myself now? I don't have to take someone to dance. I don't have to pick someone up from soccer. I need, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> and um, 
I was walking from the car one day to my house and I noticed that the yard just looked really kind of boring. And so I thought, well, I'll plant some flowers. And so I went to Lowe's and looked around and I actually went to the clearance rack and there were so many, <laughs> you all know, <laughs> there, were, there were so many plants there, but they looked horrible. And I thought, well, you know, I scratched the stem. There's still some green. <laughs> it's alive. So I started collecting these plants from Lowe's. And I started out with a little bed on the corner of the yard. And then before I knew it, I had another bed on the other corner. <laughs> and then there was a big bed in the middle. <laughs> and what I learned was I kind of transferred that, that um, taking care, <laughs> that caring for my kids to caring for my plants. And it just was the beginning of this inspiration <laughs> of loving flowers. And what I found was I never went for the plants that were nice and big and beautiful. I wanted the ones that were half dead, the ones that no one else wanted. They were just kind of thrown over in the corner because I knew that there was still life there and that if they had a little bit of nurturing and care that they would flourish and they did. And that kind of led me to, okay, I have life <laughs> still in me. And so I decided that I would go back to school. I had gone to UNC and I never finished my degree. So I thought, I'm gonna go back to school. I'm gonna get that poli-sci degree. I'm gonna you know, do amazing things <laughs> finally. <laughs> and so I went back to school. But I was in school and it was very stressful <laughs> because I was working full time, I was in school full time. So I was still gardening. I would come home, I would plant something, I would water, I would you know, go get a new plant. And what I found was I was spending as much time studying about plants and how to take care of them, how to start from seed, as I was studying for my econ class. And by the time I did get my degree, but by the time I graduated, I knew I was supposed to be a flower farmer because that is where I found peace and that is where I found life and I just knew if I don't do this, I can't make it. <laughs> and so that's what I ended up doing. So for me, plants, it's like a way of showing you that there is, there are new possibilities. There's always life where it looks like there's not <laughs> and that you can do something new and flourish. Well, thank you for that. Good job. Good job, everybody. <laughs> One term that you said that I think will inspire this next question is flourish. Flourish is, is to spree forth and to be healthy, right? To be productive in this here green industry. And in the green industries, the industries where people are working with plants, and again, whatever form they take, there is a decline in people taking up the mantle, as it were, whether it's to go to university and to get a degree related to it or to simply work in the field. Can you, again, in your own opinion, and we'll start with you, can you kind of give a, a advertisement, if it was. We're gonna pretend like we're putting something in a newspaper. And I want you to convince the next generation of why they should continue with a plant-based career. I think I would say that um, working with nature, working with plants, it's, it is hard work. But it's rewarding because when you, especially if you're starting plants from seed, if you're growing food, if you're growing flowers and you're starting from seed, the reward that you get in seeing just taking this one seed all the way to fruition, that is something that just kind of nurtures your soul 
not only can you use this industry to feed yourself, I mean, it's very important that we know where our food is coming from these days, and a lot of people are concerned. They have health concerns. They want to make sure they're eating food that's healthy. If you're growing your own food, you can be sure that your food is healthy and that you're safe. If you're growing flowers, it ministers to your soul so that you have um, something in your home that lifts your spirits when you're feeling down, it brings you joy. I think it's important for people, for young people especially, because the times that they live in are so stressful right now. I think it's important that they have something in their life that shows them that there's more than just the, the daily grind. And so what I found is that um, it's encouraging. It just encourages them to continue with whatever it is that they are striving to do. And so in this industry, yes, it's hard work, but it's rewarding work. And so I think um, that should encourage and hopefully will encourage people to to participate more in this industry. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Miss Betty, I want you to, you're, you're putting up an advertisement, you're talking to the next generation, and you're telling them why they should go into a green career again. The green spaces, these green jobs, we're seeing a decline, and that is especially impactful to us as black people, right? So what would you say to that next generation? If I was advertising? Yes, ma'am. To the next generation. I was encourage them of the benefits that they would get with this. It's rewarding to, people don't want to work hard. <laughs> That's what she said, why is everybody not working this day? Because they're they, they saying it's hard. You have to show them what the flower can do for them. The flower will, for me, as I uh, present them to people, it encourages them, and that there's a benefit to that, you know. You can reproduce it, and you would make m money. You gotta bring up money, you know, we're scared to bring up money these days. <laughs> but you better bring up that money first time. Yeah, you, you can make money, the finances will come, and you can teach them. It would go back to teaching. How do people get to me? Uh, they, they, they want to do it. People usually come to me and want me to train them. Mm -hmm. Every which way. They want me to teach them how to do this. And some came, most everybody started some kind of business. I've, I've trained a lot of people to open their own florists, to do their own flowers, to make, add something on to, I have a lot of them. Do better than I do, because I'm in it for a different reason. I have the love and I want to pass a legacy passed on. You may not pass a legacy on to your children, but everybody, you got other peoples. I have peoples that I've trained to do many things, many things. Even not only in this country, but in other countries. You know. And so wherever I went, I took the total me. I didn't take part of me. I went there to minister but also I went there to encourage them and give them something else to do. You know, I went to Africa many times and we, I took the whole me. I took the whole me. Let's go out on this, on this road and let's pick up this trash. That was the whole me. I had to be an example. Mm -hmm. I had to be an example. On Saturday morning I said, meet us back here and we'll go out and show how beautiful it can be with no trash stored everywhere. But those of you who've been to Lagos, you know it can, it at one time can be very trashy. But we picked up trash and got rid of it. We just didn't throw it out the window. Teaching a new way. I couldn't, it was hard to teach floristry over there because they trying to eat over there. And some flowers they can eat, but not these flowers, you know. So it's the encouraging you take the whole you to show them a better way, better way. Most people come to me because they see the end result. 
They see an end result of what I have. I, I, I minister, but I have a flourish. And somebody asked me, how do you juggle those two together? This is how you juggle the two. Come on and let's go out to the floors. And I continue, continue talking to you there, meaning you're going to help me out there <laughs> if I'm giving some of this <laughs> I said, come on. I, that's, that's, what I, that's what I tell my uh, brother. My brother lives by himself now, and his friends come over, and then he don't get nothing done. I said, this is what you do. Talk from room to room. <laughs> and they'll, they'll come with you. Is that right? Yeah. Come on, let's, let's go. Uh, that's how they pick up doing th some flowers for me. Uh, they have hands on. I had something they wanted. I needed something they had. I need hands. Uh, they, they, they over there, my hands, my extra hands, my extra feet, my extra mind that help make input, you know. So, but I'm giving something. You have to give something. You got to have something to give. I tell my, my son said, I want to go to Africa, man. He went with me oh, once or twice there. I said, I have to tell him, you got to take something in order to have people to help you. You got to have something to say. Get your stuff together and say something. You know, don't just tell me you can make it. Talk to them. And uh, I was telling him I just got a new uh, delivery person. And uh, he brought the flowers over this morning. And I was out there and he said, Miss Betty, you need to put something else right here. I was telling him that. I never knew that part of him. But he just, be, he comes and wait on me to finish everything and give him the go ahead. But he recognized what I was doing as I was making the flower. I was filling in places. And he recognized that. And so now he's more interested in doing more than just delivering the flowers. So that's, the, that's how you advertise, by self-experiences. Put them on, put, give them some hands-on something to do, you know? Well, I appreciate that. We love a hands-on experience. <laughs> Justin? Same question, you're advertising new generations, green industry. Um, I have this lec lecture that I taught once. It's called Everything is Plants. Um, it was to young kids. And we talked about how everything essentially that you do and wear and experience in the world has connected to the plants. We're in this building right now. You're sitting in wood, right? Wood is what's holding up this building. You got plants on your body. If you're wearing cotton or linen, even if you're wearing polyester, that's ancient plants. <laughs> the plastics that, are, that we use to build our world now are ancient plants and animals. Everything's plants already. Everything you've eaten is plant-derived, whether it's meat or not meat, okay? And so the question is, what do we now want to do with this, right? What the issue I have found is that our experience with plants is all mitigated through corporations. We don't have any personal experience with it, even though we are surrounded by plants at all moments and all, and all the derivatives of plants at every moment. We don't have any personal experience with plants. As Miss Betty was saying, it is the getting your hands on it. Show somebody that this plant can be turned into rope. Mm -hmm. watch, watch the thing happen, right? Watch the thing, watch how these leaves from this poke salad gets turned into dinner. Wow. Right? That transformational process of seeing things go from something that's a bunch of stuff in the woods turns into something that is useful to your life, something that you're going to go use, right? Wow. And so for me, that's the, that's the advertisement. It ha you, ha you have to be able to see the transformation. Like, oh, I didn't know that that's where rope come from. Rope is just plants, right? Yeah. Your cotton is just plants. Linen is just plants, right? Every carved statue, all of this stuff in here, all of this beautiful work up there is just plants, right? And so that's, that's usually the spiel I give and will continue to give that you're, you live in a world mitigated and surrounded by plants. And I'll tell you something even more interesting. Plants created fire. More. Without plants, there is no fire. Fire only exists on Earth because fire needs carbon, right? And where's all the carbon from? Plants. Wow. Without plants, there is no fire. 
It is the, it is the thing that makes human life possible is plants. I mean, water and soil and all that stuff too. But it is our, it's our most clear interface. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I want you to know, I'm stealing that last part. Um, hopefully I'll give you credit, but I'm stealing that last part. So I didn't make it up. You, I'm glad. PBS Eons, Thank watch the show. Great, great. They don't mind I steal it from them. So one thing you said, because this is a conversation here, is we're cultivating this discussion about um, Afroecologies and ethnobotanies related to black folk is transformation, the transformative nature of plants, and how we can literally use them, as black people say, to use what we have to get what we need. So that could be using that poke to make the poke salad, or using you know, a, a assembly of flowers to make something gorgeous. I'm sure each of you have done something creative, something unique, something wonderful with these plants, right? Something that maybe the average person does not do with these plants. And I know these people want to hear about it. So Justin, we're going to start with you. We're going to start in reverse order. I know big eyes. We're going to start with you in reverse order. What is something unique, creative that you have done with the plants? And this is a question that is going to really take them to dig out of themselves. Because something that we may think is a not phenomenal, they may think is just their regular Tuesday. So something that the, the average planter, the average person wouldn't do. It could be foraging, it could be herbal medicine, it could be anything with floriculture or gardening. What you got for us, Justin? Okay. Toothbrushes. Okay. So how did people brush their teeth before we had toothbrush and toothpaste? People did it, right? People had we teeth. Used the wood. What did you use? The, the, so a twig. Yeah, of? Oh, Dogwood. Dog wood. Yeah, that's what it was. Dogwood is your toothbrush tree. Okay? That is what my great-grandmother used. We did. That's what my dad said that his people used also. Dogwood is the thing that you can use to brush your teeth. So, we, so dogwood has a chemical in it called chincodine. Chincodine is related to quinine. And so that that, that phytochemical that's there helps to break down the bacteria in our mouths that causes plaque and gingivitis and all that stuff, right? Your toothpaste is not doing that. No, it's not. Right? The other plant that you can use to brush your teeth is black gum. So black gum, uh, sometimes people call it bee gum, and dogwood are the things that, so that's something weird, right? But it wasn't weird. Even just a few generations ago, this is how people had teeth. People didn't, people's teeth weren't just falling out of their heads, you know, <laughs> every, every day. I know it's happening to some, but people had teeth, <laughs> right? And so we had to figure out a way to care for them. And so when I sort of say everything is plants and everything goes, goes back to plants, both directly or indirectly, that's kind of the thing that I mean. And so that's one example. And so I don't do that all the time, but um, that is a good way if like you're out camping or out in the woods or whatever, just take a piece off and chew, 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 and you'll be able to notice the difference of, of the amount of chemicals that is in that dogwood over the course of the year. At certain times of the year, it's so strong. You'd be like, ah, <laughs> maybe not today. Right, go choose another, go choose another one. Um, I mentioned this earlier, making rope. I learned how to make rope and twine during the pandemic uh, because I, my, my mind was, uh, I was losing track of time. I didn't have a way to keep track of time. So I was like, well, let me do something that is seemingly infinite. And so I learned how to make rope. So do y'all know the plants? You've seen them everywhere, they're everywhere. They're big and spiky. They got big spiky, spiky leaves that look like swords. That plant is called bear grass or, yes. yuc or yucca filamentosa that makes some of the most beautiful twine and rope that you've ever seen. Gorgeous, fine, thin, strong. And so wow. I use that to make myself rope. I just added to it, it became my part of my meditative process. I added to it every night. And the thing about rope is that you can make it as long as you want to. You just keep going and going and going and going and going and going and going. And going. 
right? And it gives and it gave me a relationship with that plant that I didn't have. I just see it growing on the end of people's driveways or whatever as a way to do what that plant has, you know, our ancestors used to use that to make rope, but I didn't know that until I started it. And so um, I encourage you to go try it. It's very easy, you're not gonna hurt the plant by taking a few leaves. Um, and it's a very easy and very soothing process. Thank you. Same question, something unique, creative that you have done with the plants. Yeah, I, I don't know that this is very, very unique, <laughs> but one thing that I do when I'm doing arrangements is I like to incorporate um, plants that not are not commonly used or not used um, a whole lot, like using herbs like basil and sage and um, ro not rosemary, well, sometimes rosemary, things like that as the greenery in flower arrangements. Um, I, I'm sure that a lot of people probably do that, but I, I like to use things that you don't normally see when you go. Um, and they have a, a really pleasant smell and people really enjoy being able to experience. It's not just what the bouquet looks like, but what it smells like. Sometimes it can evoke a memory of family members or a time in their life. And so I like to incorporate plants, herbs, and things like that that have a, an aroma that people can relate to. Awesome, awesome, Miss um, Betty. This is a little different. I was, went to a, a family doctor. I, I don't normally go to that one, but mine was closed. And I was sitting in the lobby, and they was playing a video. And the video was about garlic, you know, the pl garlic plant. And it says, take that. It's like a penicillin. I never forgot that. And at that time of my life, we didn't, my son and I didn't have health insurance. So I went back and I started incorporating that garlic and honey with everything. Mm. Anything happen, take this in. <laughs> Anything happen, we're gonna take this in. Cause I had prayed, I said, God, how are we gonna make it with no insurance? That garlic and honey have taken me to this day. Mm. I take that garlic and honey for everything, you know. Mm. My son can't stand the garlic. <laughs> I managed to not take it if I'm coming around people because they said they can smell it, you know. But that was the most unique thing that I think that I learned from a plant. Because I'm a person that goes back. I look for plant this, some made of plant, even the food that's made of plant and stuff like that. I love the natural. I look for the herbs that heal for my medicine. I have insurance now, though, double insurance. <laughs> but if it helped me back then, it'll help me today. If it helped me back then, it's going to help me back now. The rest of them around me may not take it as much, but at least I know I'm a witness to it. I'm a witness that it brought me through. Awesome, awesome. So, witnessing. Witnessing is a great thing that we all can do because as we've been here, we have heard each of your witnesses, witnessing, whatever the proper word for it is, of plants, right? And all of you in the audience, all of you online, have also your own intrinsic stories of plants and how they touched you. In the black communities, in black green spaces or landscapes, they're often devoid of plants. We, we may see a lower socioeconomic area that doesn't have as many plants as we would like, there may not be a garden or a botanical garden or a green space in general hubbed near black spaces in most cases. I've seen one in Florida. Um, in addition to, we can generally tell if an area has been gentrified by what that green space really looks like, right? So we'll start with you again, Ms. Betty. Okay. Can you tell me, make sure I got my question right here, the role as you see it of flowers, green spaces, gardens within the black landscapes or black lives. What they, what they give us, what they can do for us, as you see it. Well, I know that one thing that as I have it in my home, it helped me breathe better. 
That's one of the things that I know. Um, it beautifies. However, my younger days, I would plant a lot of plants. But these days, as you get older, you stop doing some of those things. And it's harder to hire people even to do that for you. So I, I don't have as many. But it, it changed the uh, uh, looks of things. That's one sure thing. Uh, the plants, we would go out and used to just dig up a plant that we like, and we would bring it back. Or we go to, like you said, Lowe's where it's marked down. It is marked down, and we go pick, get those and come back and plant them and nourish them. So I would say uh, just seeing something come alive, something grow, you know. I have things that I planted. It was small, but now it's grown up to be an adult. I guess it's an adult. And it's getting sort of out of hand, you know. It's sort of like the, y'all know what a fig buttercup is? You know what it is, right? Mm -hmm. You don't really want them around. Mm -hmm. You don't want them around. It, it just multiplies. It takes over the, the, the place. It's a beautiful plant. Mm -hmm. It's the most beautiful plant. When I first saw it, I wanted that plant. But it says it suffocates all the other plants. It takes the shade away from other plants because it grows so rapidly. And once it grows, it shuts out everything else. I wanted that plant so bad. But when I saw how bad it was with its beauty, I knew I don't have nobody to help me get that plant up and stop it from growing. It grows rapidly. You have one. It grows rapidly. It'll stay on your property and go on somebody else's property, too. <laughs> you know, that's the problem there. The bus driver gave me some, and I, I, mean, I put them up against my fence, and they just grow everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. So when you get something, you got to know what you're getting. <laughs> <laughs> you get that stuff, and the, like some of the ivy, you know, it'll run so much you can't get rid of it. So I learned down through the years that there are some things I can bring on my property and some things I can't, you know, so. Okay, that's it. That's it, okay, cool beans. Justin, what's the question? That is a good question. Um, the, role of, the role of green spaces as you see it in black communities, like what can they give us? What should we, why do we need them in that sense? Uh, the green spaces in black communities. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say I haven't seen this done well um, because oftentimes when black neighborhoods or whatever start to get beautified, that means that it's going to be gentrified, right? And so, to be honest with you, I haven't seen a lot of spaces that are beautified and that black people could continue to still live in that space. Okay, so. That's not something I have any experience with. Um, what I can say is that in the rural spaces, um, the green spaces, whether they're places where you went to go pick blackberries or people's gardens or whatever, that they became a place where people to meet, right? So, oh, let's go down to the whatever. You know, we're going to go pick wild plums or we're going to go to the poke salad patch or we're going to go whatever, wherever. They become, these, they become these places where people can meet each other. Right, and one of the issues that we don't that we have now is that we don't really have places to meet each other that are not about commerce. Right? Where's the space that you can go that's not church that is you don't have to buy something to be there? You don't have those spaces. There's no spaces like that. If you're gonna be in there, you better be spending money. And so what about the people who don't have any money to spend or you just don't want to spend money? These green spaces become a place where people can meet each other without commerce needing to be there, right? And so I see that as the role that they can continue to play. But again, I have not seen these spaces where black folks get to stay in the spaces that are beautiful. Astute observation. I've also seen the same. Ms. Cheryl? So green spaces and their roles in the black communities, why we need them, what they give us, in your view. Yeah. Well, when I think specifically about flowers, um, I remember seeing on, I think it was Instagram, 
um, a couple of years ago, I watched a video of um, some black men being given flowers. And they were talking about how this was the first time in their lives that they had ever been given flowers. And the emotion <laughs> that it evoked in them, I think it's important that people feel worthy that flowers can do that. I mean, they can make you feel worthy. I mean, that's flowers are a luxury item, actually. I mean, not everybody can just, you know, go out and buy a bouquet of flowers every week. And if you are someone who's on a fixed income or you just, you know, you're just trying to buy food, having flowers is not going to be <laughs> important to you. But it doesn't mean that you don't, you know, you don't love flowers or you don't want flowers in your home. You want to have a, you know, a beautiful kitchen table too. Mm -hmm. So I think what flowers can do is, is make people know, and especially in our community where we don't always have, you know, that kind of thing around. I didn't, you know, growing up have flowers on the table all the time. They make you realize that you're worthy. You're worth having this nice thing. You can have the joy that they bring to you. And so I think it's really important that we create opportunities for people, all people, to have access to these nice things, these beautiful flowers, that they can enjoy them in their homes, that they can come, you know, come to my farm, you know, and, and see how they're grown and experience it and know that this is something that you can be a part of. It's not just for people who can afford nice things. That's so that's what I think. We love that. So I know none of you knew you were coming here to get homework, right? But all of you, under the sound of my voice, online, in person, here's what I want you to do, right? I want you, if you are a black man, to go and buy yourself some flowers. It could be one. It could be a, a dozen. You can go to your Whole Foods. You, we have florists up here. You can support them. Find a black florist if you can and do that. If you are not a black man, I want you to find one in your life. Find one and buy them some flowers, especially before the end of next week. Can we all do that? Good deal. Good deal. Good deal. So we have a little bit of time left, right? So now because I'm tired of asking questions. We're gonna ask any of you, do you have any questions? We've asked some beautiful questions to the people today. We have really had them um, to, again, cultivate conversations around botanical history as it relates to black people here in the Americas, outside of the Americas. Are there any questions that you all may have? Okay, I see two hands over here. There's probably some over here. We're gonna start with the young lady in the mask. So to repeat the question, a keystone lock, a key factor you would like to improve to improve our success with green spaces in black communities. So we'll start with Cheryl. Um, I would say I wish more people would just start um, at their own home. And I know not everyone has a space in their yard to plant things. But even just like having a few pots like on your patio or a, a few pots outside the door, just start small. If everyone in the neighborhood is doing that, just trying to do a little something, plant something, something green, and it just kind of connects the community and hopefully will lead to more in the community being grown. But just start where you are, start with one small thing that you can do in your own space to make your life a little greener. Okay, so 
key factor, you would do one thing you would do to improve the success opportunities of green spaces in black communities. Justin. You're not going to like this answer. Black communities have to have sovereignty. That's the only way you're going to be able to improve it. Powerful answer. <laughs> Powerful answer. Ms. Betty, key factor, one key factor to improve um, success of green spaces and black spaces. One of the things that I incorporate is that when a uh, plant get, what I see is it needs to leave my attention because I'm spending too much time and effort to keep it going, is to find someone to give it to. <laughs> and I find somewhere that it can have somebody to love it and nourish it. That's what I do with my flowers. I know when it's going past the halfway mark, find someone, make an arrangement, and give it to them. And it becomes something they love. Mm -hmm. And so that's way that I can, if it's a plant and I know, hey, we have watered this enough. We've done everything with this plant. It's time for us now to find a new home. If nobody needs this plant, then let's find somebody to give it to. And I've given away a lot of them like that. I love that. As my grandmother says often, you need to make some other arrangements. She often said that when she's frustrated. <laughs> I love that. I love That's that. what my grandmother says. She needs to make some other arrangements. So we had, an, we had another question over here. Young lady in the coral. Good morning. I am a transplant here from up north, and I love to garden, but I have been struggling with the earth here. I, I will say I live in a, um, a subdivision, I guess that's what they call it, and I've watched them build them, so I know how they take the good dirt and what they leave, but if you could give me some advice as to how I can improve the soil in my garden, I would love that. So this one, if you have any of us up here, any of you panelists, I should say, have any suggestions on improving the soil here? And you're in Durham, right? So specifically fighting this clay that is in the Raleigh-Durham area, because it, it is rough, and it's tough, and it's mean. If y'all have any, I, I know from personal experience, if y'all have any suggestions, we'll do this as popcorn. Who, who has something to say? I'll start. Again, um, you're not going to like these answers. <laughs> Don't think of the soil as something is being wrong with the soil. That's how the soil is supposed to be, number one. This isn't England. The soil is supposed to be red. It's supposed to be clay. So start, wipe away the notions of what should or should not be. Work with it as it is. The best way to work with our native soil is to use native plants. They know how to handle the soil. They will turn the soil into the ideal version of what we think it should be. Okay, the reason why the soil is like that is because the mistreatment of the soil and of the plants. But that soil is perfect. Believe that it is perfect in its form as it currently is. Good deal, good deal. Do you have something to add to that? Um, well, I love the soil. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I love the, the red clay. However, it was very hard for me to plant in the red clay. So what I did is I did sheet mulching in my backyard. So I basically, uh, I brought in, it was a process. It took years. It took like almost seven years for my soil to get the way it is now. But I, I brought in um, compost. I put down cardboard, and I covered the whole thing in wood chips. And I left it for the winter. And in the spring, the soil was a little bit easier to plant in. I would go out periodically and bury, um, don't tell my HOA, <laughs> <laughs> I would bury um, vegetable scraps, you know, anything that I had that was on the way out, I would just bury it. I would bury it all over the backyard. And my soil is amazing now, but it took years. It took many, many years of just tending to it. I bought red worms. <laughs> I got them in the mail, and I put them out in the soil. And so I just kind of fed the soil 
for years, and now it's it's good. So. Okay, okay. Ms. Betty, you got something to add to that? I was I was having difficulty with some soil too, planting uh, just flowers, and so I came up with the idea that um, I had an old file cabinet, one of the longer ones. I disassembled it, and I uh, made a flower uh, for me to plant stuff in, a uh, garden. And although it's so big, you put branches at the bottom, and then anything like that, and then you start putting different dirt, and then you put the soil you want in there. It, it became a soil transplant, okay? A garden transplant into that. And that's what I'm working on now to make it better. I, I use file cabinets. I need the drawers for the little smaller one, which didn't do so well, but not because of the soil, but because of the deers. <laughs> the deers. What'd you say? I went and bought some stuff one time to put on that, that, that. And the, the deers use it as a sa uh, dressing, putting on a salad. <laughs> <laughs> I was so disappointed with that there, I said. So I bought stuff to spray around. I said, it's getting too expensive. Let's go another round. So I put it near my, 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 my step, my handicap ramp at my back. And so I'm working on it now. They just come out and just pick it up and take the whole head of something and go on off with it. So, um, but if I, I, I made, I'm making out of file cabinets, you especially get, get rid of those, you, I would go get them and then you would, you could just make flower beds on top of flower beds. I have a, a big enough space to do that. So you can, you don't have to use it. I can't put dirt in all of that. Put branches at the bottom and put leaves and stuff next, debris next, uh -huh. and then just on the top for the root of where you think it's gonna go, then you put your soil. Well, that is great, you know. Deer are definitely a problem here. So we had another question over here. I believe the young lady in the black. Is for Justin? No, I'm sorry. Um, in the program, you're described as the chocolate botanist. What? Can you leave, can you raise your mic up? In the program, someone is described as the chocolate That's botanist. Me. Okay. That's me. <laughs> and I was just interested in how you got that name or what. Oh wow! You asked the moderator a question. I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying not to talk about myself this whole time. Look at you. So I am the chocolate botanist. I originally started off as the crazy botanist. I work with a nonprofit in North Durham, um, Urban Community Agronomics. If you have not heard of them, you can. The letter U C A N, amazing black founded nonprofit that has a farm in North Durham, okay? I would work with some of my elders who grew plants in a different way than I would grow. I would do square foot gardening and other methods. I do a lot of wild stuff in gardening that most people say you shouldn't do because I'm a whole plant biologist. And I, I know the basics and the concepts and the foundation, so I know how to get and take shortcuts to get places, right? And they wouldn't agree with my techniques, so I would say, hey, I'm just a crazy botanist. I don't know what I'm talking about. Somebody said, you should brand that. I was like, nah, nobody ever wants to hear me. How would I ever have success in that? I'm, nobody wants to see me, right? And after really being convinced and thankful, and I'm so thankful for the persistence of black women, because it was a black woman who convinced me and, and basically pushed several, really, that pushed me to do this. Um, I ended up using that brand. But after a time on the Instagram, which I do a lot of work on, um, I would talk and be like, if y'all need a chocolate man in your life, that's what I used to say. I'm a little wild when I'm not moderating. If you need a chocolate botanist in your life, you should hit me up. I was a single man, right? Um, and I was like, single man, single chocolate botanist, da 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 da, right? So somebody else, another black woman said, you should rebrand yourself as the chocolate botanist because it, it invokes a different reaction than the crazy botanist. And after her convincing, because I can be a little stubborn, I went with it. So that's how I got the name. I do all types of stuff on the inter internet, scientific communicator. I speak. I'm a plant biologist. I do a lot of stuff. So enough about me. Thank you. <laughs> we got this young. OK, we got some questions over here. There's the mic coming. The mic is coming for one of your hands. There we go. My question is, how do you get autism kids involved in um, gardening? 
Can you ask that again? How do you get autism kids um, involved in planting or gardening? Okay, so the question is getting the especially um, the differently abled community involved in gardening, those who may have autism or Asperger's, how do we get them um, involved in gardening? Do any of you have any commentary on that? I don't have You don't, do you? Okay, Justin. Oh, so I, we got one over here, so we'll bring the mic to her. Um, Derek has a brother who is mildly autistic and generally with that community, I just try to present the idea, and that's just to anybody, to get anybody interested in gardening, I present the idea. If you wanna do it, phenomenal, I'll make it fun. If you don't wanna do it, again, phenomenal, I'll give you your own time to come to it, right? There are some people in general, despite or in, despite or in disregardless, can't think of words right now, of uh, their exceptionality who don't wanna garden. So I just present the idea, but we had this young lady right here. What you got to say for us? Yes, hello, my name is Deborah Gibson. I have a nursing background, but last summer I completed my therapeutic horticulture and did uh, quite a bit with exceptional needs kits. And I would say autism and you know, the broader spectrum of any particular diagnosis, when we worked with children, one of the phenomenal things was letting them guide the experience there were things we set up. There's actually a really great resource um, called THAD, T-H-A-D, and it is the therapeutic agriculture database for activities. You could look through and find them for different capabilities. And one of the best things that I learned was being able to set up an environment for a particular person to explore, whether it was sand or soil, because you do have to be sensitive to their sensory aversions and sensitivities, but it was amazing to see just how far they would go, and the biggest thing you can do is to just follow their lead while you're going into their world and then allow them to lead the experience that you've set up for them. And uh, I learned more, I feel like. I took away more than any of the kids did. Phenomenal. <laughs> Phenomenal. So we got this young lady in the back with a hat. I think she had a question. First, I want to thank each of you. I've enjoyed this panel so very much. And since this ultimately is about community, do any of you have any experience in building community gardens? Experience in building community gardens, if any of you have experience. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, ish. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think so. I'm part of Earth Seed Land Collective, which you saw in the um, in your pamph pamphlet, and we have a garden on site. It's uh, and there are people here who are part of Farm Share here, um, and it's community gardening in a sense, but it is a different kind of a model. Uh, it's a model, this is so the farmers are Taz Walker and Christina um, Rivera Chapman who head that, head that up. It's basically households come together to work together in a, uh, in a farm space in which you're getting the ability to learn. So it's not like this is my little 10 by 10 thing, this is your little 10 by 10 thing. It's everybody working together, right, for, you know, well, everybody's working on squash today or everybody's working on whatever. And then the produce is shared throughout folks, right? So it's not like this is my two ears of corn that I got after this harvest. <laughs> you're able to share in the greater bounty because the work um, is uh, more effective if you're all if you're working on these sort of larger scales, right? And not only that, so folks are bringing. Uh, so this is not my project. I'm just this is a description of of a project. Um, I've seen uh, many other kinds of community gardens, and sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't work. The aspect of community gardens should really, really be focused on the community aspect. So, how are you community building? And so, it's not just somebody having their little plot in which they come out at whatever time that they and you never see the other people who are there. How are you actually building the community? So, for farm share, people are all there at scheduled days at the same time, um, and there's not just the 
active gardening part or the farming part, but it's also how do you process this stuff? How do you take these things that are uh, cabbage leaves and turn it into kimchi, right? You need that sort of entire process, and that can all be done together, right? And there are folks here who if you want to talk to about who know more about the um, know more about that. But I think community gardening is not a thing because we've always done community gardening. <laughs> like, you know, there's no way you can't farm by yourself. That's not a thing. That's um, right. You just can't. It's not possible. So. Um, the sort of rebranding as a community garden is like there's no other way to do it. You have to have people. You can't do it by yourself. Um, so I think the focus on the community and how you are building community through the process of gardening um, as opposed to trying to get six tomatoes at the end of the year. Like what's the actual community building space? Awesome. So we have the mic over, over here somewhere? Yes, down here. Uh-huh. Hi, Peace. Um, I have an answer. Um, to the community garden and autism. Um, first with the children with autism. Uh, I'm from Fairview, North Carolina, um, and I have an organization called the Afro Earth Connection. And so we have worked with children, I have worked with children, and so one of the things with um, working with children with autism in the garden is, uh, it was said, working to their senses. Um, whether it can be in song, education, knowledge, versus directly getting into the dirt and understanding um, how the plant grows, you can reach the child in every single um, aspect of plant life growing. Um, so it's really good to have different plans according to the child that uh, really likes to listen to songs. So you know, find plant songs, or the child that really likes to um, touch books or things or dirt actually, you know, without eating it, you know, understanding that, you know. So the child that likes bugs, there's bugs there, you know. Getting to the child how they see fit is the best when it comes to gardening. And it's also one of the best methods to learn other things, communication, trust, um, uh, getting um, out of their comfort zone and just learning. Sometimes days may seem the same, but with gardening, you have no choice but to see the change because there's something growing in there. So they're able to understand that as well. Another thing I would say with the community garden, I am a part of a, um, it's a community garden in Fayetteville, North Carolina, right in the center of a black community that is actually in the process, which looks like being gentrified, but it still works. It's a nonprofit called the Fayetteville Friendship Community Garden, and within that, the Afro Earth Connection is able to uh, rent out um, plots uh, for $20 a year to be able to cultivate and do the things that we want. I will say, for this instance, the community garden is needed because a lot of the things that we grow, the neighbors take it. You know, they take it. And so many times what we ask in return is that they just come and work when we do. Um, they can see us when we're working. It's right in the middle of the neighborhood. You look, look out your window, you can hear us, see us, and all those things. And people are able to come around and watch you and ask and tell you stories about how their grandma used to have a, a collard green patch in their front yard and things of that nature. So I think that it, you can start off with one person because me and my friend, me and her, started off by just gardening by ourselves when there weren't major gardening days. And people would come, and people would ask, and we would post, and people would see us. Um, and they would ask about gardening days and bring their children. So I think if one person has the drive to do so, then many will follow. And so our next goal in Afro Earth Connection is to get the container gardens or gardening in different ways into the homes because everybody doesn't have access to rural land. Everybody can't afford it. So you have to meet people where they're at. So that's how you can have that community garden aspect. That's how you can expand and get people hand to garden to mouth. Awesome, and that is the Afro Earth Connection. Please follow them on the social media. We have time for one more question. So, so my question go back to disabled people also. So in, how do you get disabled people with different types of disabilities involved with gardening? So it would be if you got somebody with um, arthritis in their back or hips, or if you got somebody with hand arthritis, um, what, what do you do to get them involved in, in gardening? Are there tools that they can use or, or something? So for those who are differently abled, any tools or situations we can use? And this will be our last question. We're gonna have to be brief with this one, right? So do y'all have any answers for that? Getting differently able people involved in gardening? 
I have I don't have any personal experience in doing this, um, but what I have seen other folks do in other spaces is, especially for people who are in wheelchairs or in other way or in other ways or can't stoop down, that they build the beds up so folks are not having to stoop down so much. Um, there are other there's other kinds of ways of doing this and sort of like vertical gardening where you don't have to stoop down at all, right? Just sort of at eye, at eye level. Um, there are lots of different ways that. To, to think about some of this stuff. And thank you, first of all, thank you for bringing up the point and the, fo and, the fo and the person who commented about autism because we do actually want to be able to bring as many people into this um, as possible because everybody, should they desire it, should be able to access this. This is not, should not be some sort of exclusive club that is for you know somebody who is able-bodied um, in the way that we see that. So um, yeah, I think that there are ways to do that. Um, and this feels like a challenge to me to like figure out how to like incorporate more of that into my own practice. Um, to, because some things are, you know, I do a lot of stuff on, and I'm in the field a lot, and so these are not always access accessible to other to folks who are who don't have the same a, a amount of mobility. So, what are other ways that we s sort of can help? Is a challenge to for me to think more about too. Yeah, awesome sauce. So. I have just this one question for each of the panelists and the moderator. Uh oh. With it, simple, quick answer since we're trying to close out this session. What one plant would you like to see every black person growing? So, one plant that you would like to see every black person grow. We'll keep this brief so we can wrap it up. One plant. I'll go last because I'm the moderator. I set the, the order. So I'm going to go last. You know, this is power right here. I love this. So, Miss Betty, one plant that you would like to see black people grow. And just a brief reason on why. Oh, uh, I just give the one I like the most, okay? Okay. Um, the uh, calla lily. Amen. And what does a calla lily mean to you? It just means so much. It's so beautiful. Okay. It, has, it, it grows beautiful, lasts long. And I use it in a lot of places. Uh -huh. You can plant them and they multiply. Okay. They really multiply. You have to break them apart and keep putting them out there. That's all I have two on both sides of my building, one here. But it kept multiplying. I haven't seen the head yet. I know it's coming but it has a lot of beauty to it. I use it in weddings and everything. So they are a beautiful flower with yeah. multifaceted uses. Justin. Could you repeat uh, the name of that one plant? I'm sorry. Could you repeat the name of that one plant? You she just said a calla lily. Calla, C-A-L-L-A lily. Beautiful, tall inflorescence. You've probably seen them in a lot of southern gardens. Justin? Uh, this is one that people probably are already growing, which is snake plant. Um, and the reason why you probably garden it that you don't know that you, you have that plant and why I've seen it in every black person's house I've ever met um, is because that plant comes to us from Nigeria. Yep, that is part of our ancestral uh, plant palette. In Yoruba, that, that plant is called Ojai Koko, which means the hyenas, um, you know, the thing that you use to carry babies? Yeah. That's what it's called. It's the, it's the way that the hyenas carry their babies. So we wow. used to... That's not, that's the, what the name, name, name of the plant is. That's not what actually happens. Um, and that plant has been used for hypertension. And it was one of our major fiber plants. It's the, what we used to make our, the strings for our bow and arrow out of. Okay, so a beautiful house plant with beautiful history. Miss Cheryl. I would say if you are able to plant a peony bush, plant it, it will last a lifetime. It has beautiful flowers. It smells amazing. And long after you're gone, your children will be able to cut those flowers and remember you. So um, it's just a nice, a nice thing to have in your yard. Yeah. That's great. A peony, P-E-O-N-Y. Peony. Some people say peony. Yeah. That's right. So this is great. One plant, I was hoping I would have one by the time y'all were done. Um, there's so many plants I would tell people to grow, but I would say outdoor, because I'm a cheat, I'm going to do two. Outdoor, I would say do a rose bush. 
Um, a tea rose, something that has a beautiful smell because they smell beautiful. They do. You can use the rose hips in tea. If you're not using any pesticides or herbicides around them, they're safe for that consumption. And again, the smell, especially during the summer of a tea rose, is amazing. And then inside of pothos, because like the snake plant, most black people have seen a pothos, long, beautiful, vining plant in their home. So thank you all for coming to this panel. Continue pothos, P O. T H O S, spelled like pot host. That's that plant. So thank you for coming today. I appreciate y'all having. Continue to cross pollinate conversation and network. Thank you so much to the panelists. Just like to share this one announcement. Can you hear me okay? Uh, during this uh, break in session, after this session, there will be books for sale in the lobby so we can keep in the theme of planting seeds. Some of the authors that are participating today. Uh, we can have signed copies of the book. One is uh, Dr. Wanda Hendricks, uh, Dr. Zelda Lockhart, and Dr. Noel Morissette. And uh, thank you again. And I also want to add, in keeping with the theme of what Ms. Betty has said, these beautiful flowers and plants are her gift to us. These arrangements, beautiful. Thank you.
Session two will start in five minutes. Session two will start in five minutes.
We're going to ask if everyone will take their seats. We're going to start session two in a minute. We ask that everyone take their seats. We're going to start in two minutes. Coming up, yes. Good afternoon. May I have your attention, please? We're ready to begin the second session. We have everybody, yes. Good afternoon. We're going to have, for the second session, uh, <clears throat> the person introduced to the presenter will be Joanna Massey. <clears throat> Joanna Massey Lalikas will be here to introduce, do the introduction. Thank you for attending again. Hello, wonderful presentation here coming up about Ann Spencer's garden. And it's my honor to introduce these ex uh, esteemed moderator and speakers. Our moderator today is Leonita Inge. And you know her as the co-host of WUNC's Due South. Leonita has been a radio journalist for more than 30 years, spending most of her career at WUNC as the race and Southern culture reporter. Sean Spencer Hester is a gardener, interior designer, and the executive director and curator of the Ann Spencer House and Garden Museum in Lynchburg, Virginia. Dr. Zelda Lockhart is an author and director of Her Story Garden Studios, inspiring black women to self-define, heal, and liberate through our stories and nature. 
She holds a PhD in expressive art therapies. And Dr. Noelle Morissette is an author and director of African American and African Diaspora Studies and professor of English at UNC Greensboro. She is also an advisory board member of the Ann Spencer House and Garden Incorporated and the author of Ann Spencer Between Worlds, released in 2023. So our moderator, Leonita Inge, I hand it off to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here, to be constantly reminded about how I'm not a good gardener. <laughs> no one mentioned green thumb, I noticed earlier today. But I'd like the, the, the wonderful panel um, to please come up to the stage. Sean Spencer, Hester, Zelda Lockhart. <laughs> And Noel Marset, thank you. Hello. <laughs> You know, one reason why I was excited to be here today, just by the, the, the name of this particular conversation, Ann Spencer's Garden, Understanding Black Women's Gardens as an Emancipatory Healing Space, or Emancipatory Healing Spaces. And we all know, when we think of um, black women, you know, we had to cross pollinate all of our conversations and our beings and where we worked and where we um, raised um, our children. So it's only conscionable that we used our garden spaces, you know, to do that as well. Mainly because that's probably the last place many outsiders would expect for you to be, right? And, and not just be, but to be doing the type of work that you would be doing there, which isn't always just growing flowers, is it? It's um, growing consciousness, you know, um, teaching people to help you grow respectability. Um, maybe even how to grow into your hair. Whatever conversations took place in that space, um, I'm excited about that. So I'd like to start by, you know, just start by introducing, or really reintroducing um, our audience to Ann Spencer. I see you have a beautiful picture of, um, um, of, of a beautiful space. Is that Ann Spencer's garden, Sean? This is Sean? Ann Spencer's garden. Yes, in, in Virginia. In yes. Virginia. Yeah. I thought I would bring some pictures along just so you could see what her garden looked like. This is the only restored garden of an African American in the United States. Now, when I say that, I should be proud, but I'm not in a way, because I'm proud that it's been restored, actually twice. But I'm sad because I know that there were other African American gardens, perhaps like hers. I mean, we do know through our research that there were African American garden clubs. Um, and so um, I expect that there should be more. But due to lots of things that have changed in our world, due to right. urban revitalization and um, Jim Crow, lots of those, and people just moving into houses that like gardens, I'm going to buy that house because it's a beautiful garden, but I don't know how to take care of a garden. And mm. so then it becomes weeds. But um, we're really proud of this, of this garden, and uh, we'll take you through some pictures as we talk. Thank you very much. We know Ann Spencer was, um, she was a writer, poet, a civil rights activist. Um, actually, we should all, um, we should all be a little jealous of <laughs> her guest list of people who have actually come through her space from Zora Neale Hurston, 
you know, to Martin Luther King Jr., of course. Um, so to be able to do that, we know they were doing more than just um, talking plants and, you know, where to grow the collard greens. They were, they were talking about how really to save this world. They were talking about how to grow a nation. Yes. A, and an all-inclusive nation and a space for themselves. Mm. So maybe you can tell me a little bit more about maybe what you heard as a little girl. You're her granddaughter, and I wonder what they were talking about in, um, in that home, or maybe what you heard later, even from your father, you know, of, of that, how that space was used. Oh my gosh, they were not talking. They were just talking about sit down and be quiet <laughs> and um, stand straight, put your shoulders back, and enunciate. That's what they were talking about. Now, in the garden, my grandmother had no rules in the house, which was very different from my home that I grew up with my seven siblings. And I grew up, in a, my father was military, so we were very. My grandmother said that my father, Chauncey's children, were like soldiers. <laughs> um, but my grandmother didn't have any rules in her house, which was really cool, you know. And, but in her garden, she had rules. And so that's what grandmothers you know, do. They yeah, have she no had rules in the garden. Here. So we couldn't pick the flowers, we couldn't eat the grapes, and we couldn't get into this pond. Actually, there were three ponds. But um, that was, but you know, it was just a normal house. You know, we, you, 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 you really didn't know, even in my own home with my parents, um, you didn't know that these were um, important people, or, you know, people of, that were making a difference in our world. Didn't Lang Langston Hughes? Langston Hughes, W.E.B. Du Bois, James Weldon Johnson. Yes. Sterling A. Brown, Thurgood Marshall, and George Washington Carver. So she was talking about plants with Carver. She was talking about poetry with, you know, with James Weldon Johnson, and, and she was talking about the NAACP with W.E.B. Du Bois. You know, there were lots of things. Who wouldn't want to talk plants with George Washington Carver? Oh my goodness, because, you know, I got to see some of what he did even at Tuskegee University, speaking of um, of gardens. One, um, just to change the conversation just a little, when I think of beautiful places in the South and gardens, I actually think of historically black colleges and universities. Because I don't think I visited one that wasn't landscaped beautifully and had flowers. You know, I had the luxury <laughs> of going to Florida A&M University, so that means we had palm trees you know, on campus, and, um, and even North Carolina Central University down the street, you know you're in a special place because you see the hills and you see the bushes, and I'm sure someone is really making sure whatever greenery or flowers are there, not only are maintained, but they're there during certain seasons where it'll always look nice, you know, it'll always be presentable, and you'll know you're in a special place, so I beg to give, differ when, you know, I would hear comments about, you know, maybe in black spaces that maybe you don't have as many gardens. So it's like, there's still over 100 black colleges. There are gardens everywhere, you know, especially in the southern United States. So take a road trip, you know, I, I tell <laughs> folks. <laughs> so, I didn't mean, did I cut you off, Sean? No, because no, I... Um, um, again, we were just talking about, you know, the guest list there and George Washington Carver and what he meant to agriculture and plants and horticulture and growing, so that's very special. I wonder if your um, grandmother got any tips from him. Got <laughs> any tips? I'm thinking like maybe, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me think about my friend Abram that's going to come up in the next um, talk. But um, no, my grandmother gave some tips. But did, did um, I don't know if uh, she, she, I don't think she ever talked about getting tips, but I'm sure she did. You know, they learned from each other, and that was the whole reason for them to come together mm -hmm. to come to Lynchburg. I, I consider it kind of as a, you know, a Harlem satellite. Mm -hmm. There were these Harlem satellites that were all around the country. They weren't just in Harlem, New York. These people were moving and grooving. They were going everywhere. They were even in Europe. Um, but they had one in Lynchburg, Virginia, a Harlem satellite where these people would um, sometimes are passing through because they're traveling 
and they can't stay in a hotel, and they're friends of my grandparents and they stay there, or they just need a stopover, or sometimes they'll honeymoon there, like, um, um, oh my gosh, um, Powell um, was a, oh my gosh, I can't think it was Colin, not Colin Powell, um, but anyway, his name was Powell and he was a minister, why can't I think of his name? But Adam Clayton Powell, Powell thank okay. you. Adam Clayton Powell honeymooned with his wife Isabel there. You know, so over there, they were just, you know, when they were occasions they were coming through, but the, um, what I'm saying is there were occasions that they were planned visits mm -hmm. um, to come, and they just, you know, sometimes they let their hair down. They, you know, I have some pictures on it to show you, but, um, you know, you think about these um, people that are coming to visit, that are traveling to Lynchburg, Virginia, of all places, on their way maybe from Atlanta or on their way from Tennessee, um, from Massachusetts. Like home of the Confederacy. Yeah, but these were people who were from the South, you know, and these were people who, like, um, you know, was spoken in the first session, that it's in our DNA. These, you know, this green space, mm -hmm. this cultural landscape is an important space for us. To, um, to be in, and so when they migrate to the north, they have a part of that DNA that's just clicking out there, waiting for something to happen. And they come to Lynchburg and they meet Aunt Spencer, she has this beautiful garden, and now they're reintroduced to this green space that they grew up in. So I think about them coming to Lynchburg also, not just talking about um, poetry and literature and politics and gardening, but also talking about coming to a space that, w that reminds them of home, right. that, um, that takes them back to this flower that, or a plant that they remember there, or a space that they can just breathe, clean, fresh air. Fresh air. You know, you know Noel, your book, Ann Spencer Between Worlds explores her archives, her manuscripts, so maybe you can actually enlighten us a little bit more about her place, you know, in this, in this world. Thank you for the question. Is this, is this okay? Can you hear me? Yes, right? just yeah, hold okay. it up close. <laughs> I'm, I'm in retreat usually and not in front of a microphone. Um, so I think of Ann Spencer's archives, which, you know, Sean is, is the major connector here for me to have contact with Ann Spencer's archives, both in Lynchburg and in Charlottesville at the University of Virginia. Um, I think of archives, black women's archives, as something akin to gardens and that comment that you started with, Sean, you know, this, the sense that there are plenty of black women who are gardening. We only have this kind of vestigial garden uh, of Ann Spencer's. So there's a, a kind of a neglect, a disregard, a devaluing. Um, you know, I think of Georgia Douglas Johnson, one of Ann Spencer's good friends who had this beautiful um, collection of rose bushes outside her house in Washington, D.C., uh, so much so that her neighbors called it the Riviera. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so, so there's, there is this kind of kinship or communion that's coming out of gardening practices in relationship to the writing that she's doing. Um, words can be discipline. Um, I'm thinking of your description of um, uh, life with Chauncey. But words can also be wild. Words can produce unexpected um, relationships and, and transformations. Um, and so I think for Spencer, uh, the garden space is a space of radical imagination. It's a space in which to assert a kind of ethos and an ethical practice and an attunement to um, humanity. Um, that black ecology is producing that humanity, right? It's a refusal of the categories that exist out in the world. Oh, well, this is what black people do, this is what black people don't do, 
right? This is what they can do, this is what they can't do. It's a complete refusal of that discourse, which is a controlling discourse, right? Um, and so those inventions, you know, um, seed sharing or um, the trips to find uh, unique species and bring them back and into her garden, which was a carefully curated but wild space, right? I think of her garden as a, it has a wildness to it. Um, and that's intentional, right? It's not an English curated garden. It's a wild garden that has space for communion with others, that has space for kind of the rituals with the earth, that uh, words are kind of working their way through the earth to come into being as poems. So I, I hope that's some kind of illustration of her extraordinary uh, writing. Oh, it is, it is. <laughs> Try to get to uh, when you were talking about the garden, what the garden looked like in, um, in my grandmother's. This is what the garden looked like in my grandmother's day. Um, like Noel was talking about the garden. I was just trying to get there. These are, I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay. Um, and this is what it looks like today. I'm it just going to click. It here. is beautiful. Yeah. So, as we begin to contemplate the role of the garden as a gathering space for black creatives, it brings us to Zelda. And I'd love to really um, bring you into the discussion just to speak about um, you being the director of Her Garden Story Studios. So, I'd like to know about that work and how it belongs really in this Ann Spencer tradition. So Her Story Garden and Studios um, is um, a, a real, a, an actual space and also a virtual um, space. Um, so for 20 something um, years, I gardened um, out in, on some land where I lived in Hillsboro. And that's, that space, um, as I was you know, creating and also healing and, and being, gr growing my children, growing some food, um, and also being a, a black woman in America, uh, consistently trying to remember, you know, what am I here for? What did I come here to do um, on top of the sound and consistent um, noise and punishment and violence of uh, colonization and capitalism, which is in the, the lives of black women and black people and people of color and people, period. Um, but especially um, single black women, intentionally single black mom trying to raise some children. And so, um, so with that, the garden became, the gardening became such a space where, um, where I was consistently reminded of myself as a spiritual being, um, regardless of the very small microcosm, mi destructive microcosm of, um, of colonization and humanity and its way of being naughty with racism and all of that, um, homophobia, and all of those damaging things. And so being, when you're in a system, the system, you know, which is um, the part of the system that we all belong to is nature. You know, when you're interacting with that ecology, then it's, there's this way in which, and so I'm only going to use these words because uh, the English language has so many words in it that have to do with hierarchy and superiority. Um, so that's the only reason I'm using these words. But when you, in some ways, rise uh, up out of, you know, when you're in your, in your garden, you're interacting with nature, um, you rise to the same space where the crows, the eagles, the the uh, spirit, other beings are looking at what we're doing right now with humanity and going, man, that's a shame, but everything else knows better, right? And so you return yourself to that system. And so in that work, being with um, women where I started having women come to the house because it's what I've done wherever I've lived. You know, it's like, we're gonna come to, you know, come to the house, we're gonna have uh, writing workshops, we're gonna heal, you know, put your kids in the back room. We used to call it the dungeon. It was this, be this beautiful, the, the cutest room in the house, we called it the, the dungeon. Take the kids in the dungeon, and we got a babysitter back there. 
And we're going to um, we're going to be in this space where we're just going to have um, healing and food from the garden, and you know, doing that with teenagers in the summertime with my children, with so that everybody else could have what it was that I was having, so that other women could have what it is that I was having. And now the studio's in in Durham. So. That's what I say. Are you still doing that? Yeah. I think a lot of us would love to stop by. Yeah. That'd be really yeah. nice. so because it it reminds me of these spaces. You know, when we speak of you know, these especially green spaces, not necessarily, say, in a garden, but these beautiful green spaces, it, do you find it, it as a place just to really be yourself? Like when we're outside of the green spaces, sometimes we have to pretend to be other people and speak like this on the radio. <laughs> but then when I, you know, you get to go <laughs> and be with like people in a very open green space, you can laugh really loud you know, you can sing, you can cry, can't you, Zelda? And I'm sure a lot of that takes place in the space that you're, you've curated. Yeah, we do a lot of laughing and crying. And the reason why I say it's virtual is because, you know, when you put your hand on the top of your head and you look down at your feet, you're home. So you can take all of you with you wherever you go. And so when we do foraging or go on hikes or, um, you know, just uh, journaling out in nature and telling each other stories, then all the laughing and the crying and the being loud and the, all of that comes with us. And then everyone else, the space that we have entered is changed by the flora and fauna of who we are once we enter the space. And everyone else can then acclimate and adjust. You know, we're on a trail or something, and it's just like, you know, here comes this, what is this? And it's like, it's a group of black women. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, Sean, I have to ask you, I don't know how much time you spend at the Ann Spencer House. I don't know if you live there full time, um, but why is it so important to maintain that space? I mean, it seems you've made it like your life's work. It made me its life's work. Um, I, this museum has just celebrated its 47th year. So this is not, I'm not 47. <laughs> but, um, it was established by my father in 1977, just two years after uh, my grandmother's um, death. And um, this nonprofit, and uh, my father uprooted us from California to move to Virginia to do this. It was not a happy move for us seven children, but we survived. <laughs> And I went on with my life and married and had have a son and never thought I would be involved with this museum. Although I have been throughout the years maybe doing some design work or arrangements or something like that. We were, we were the cleaning ladies for the museum, my mother and my sisters and myself. Um, so we engaged in that way. But when I came, when I returned to Lynchburg in 2008, it was really just to spend some time with my mother who was in her late 80s. She, who, she was living across the street from the museum. And I was um, almost 40. And um, so I needed something to do. I needed, you know, I just needed some work to do. I, I didn't, you know, we weren't born with a silver spoon in our mouth with this museum. So, um, but um, I'm sitting on the front porch, and I know that Garden Day, in Virginia, we have a garden week, and, um, and it's the third week in April, and I knew that that day um, on Tuesday was coming up um, in March. I knew that that day was coming. And I had been taking my mother to the board meetings and learned that the, um, the House Museum had not been open for six years since my father had died. And so that meant that people were going down past the um, house museum and going to the garden, and they were just seeing the garden for Garden Day. And I thought, well, this is really denying our, these visitors um, to learn about who Ann Spencer was. You're only just seeing a part of her. You're only just seeing the garden part of her. You're not seeing the, where she lived for all of her life for 95 years. And my grandfather, the house that he built, and so I, my background is interior design and um, I dabbled in architecture. And so I just get the key to the door to, from the basement door, my mother's house, and I go over and open the door. And it just took me back. 
I mean, even though I had been in that house throughout the years, but on that particular visit, it was as if somebody was cooking ham in the kitchen. And it, it just, it was just something about that visit. And I just rolled up my sleeves and got the hammer and, <laughs> and, um, and started and cleaning, you became waxing the a, floors. You, you became a preservationist. I became didn't a even preservationist. Yeah. I became out of the design world to a preservationist immediately. And, um, and I've been there ever since. And so I've com pretty much completely um, restored the interior of the House Museum. Mm -hmm. Any, yeah. can you think of any, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, do you have a, a couple of comments maybe that when visitors come through, what they say, when they figure out where they are? They, well, um, yeah, so Maya Angelou came after my grandmother's death and she spoke in Lynchburg and this, this was in the 80s. And I remember her, um, there's a, there's three stories to this house museum and they were, she was in the sunroom of my grandparents' bedroom and she said that she felt her spirit here. And I often get that, and I, this is not in a scary, you know, way kind of thing. It's just like, you know, I don't know if you've ever, I've, I've had that, that I feel like, you know, something is around me that comforts me, whatever that is. And so they, I often get that. Um, and sometimes I, in the house, the collection is 95% original. How many museums do you go in that you can really see how these people lived? And so you see from 1906 until 1975. You know, you'll see it through the telephones, the style of phones, you'll see it with, you know, things in the house museum, but very often people will come in and they'll say, oh, I know that, that cookie jar was in my grandma's house, mm. or that was in my auntie's house or that flower my grandmother had in her garden. And so it's those, it's recalling those memories for visitors. Mm. And when we think about history, and maybe, um, Noelle, you could speak to this a little, that I read, or I guess I understand that the home, like the garden, and the home surrounding it were built on the grounds of a former Confederate Army recruitment station um, called Camp Davis in Lynchburg, Virginia. So it makes me think, wow, what about, if anything is like reclaiming our space, you know, that is. Um, do you know more about that, Noelle? I, I, do. I think Sean is probably the, <laughs> <laughs> probably the best for this. I mean, I have places I, I can go with it, but. So, um, yeah, so this was a um, uh, uh, Civil War um, campground mm -hmm. for, um, Civil War soldiers right in the same area. It was a large area, it, which included um, Pierce Street, where Ann Spencer House is located. But um, after that, even after that, it becomes a um, federal camp. And so after the Civil War, uh, this, the federal government comes in and sets up these camps for particularly for people who are enslaved who don't have anything and don't have any place to go. So then so you have the Civil War on that same land and then you have this federal encampment of all these people that are coming out of the, the uh, mountains out of Nelson County and Amherst County, Virginia, Bedford County Forest, all around um, that are looking for food and clothing and they're staying there. And then this, and then it's this, uh, neighborhood is built in 18, actually it's annexed into the city in 1870, so pretty much ro at, right after the federal camp um, is set up. But then you have this neighborhood that comes in here, which now is known as the Pierce Street Renaissance Historic District, which was an all-black community, which is where the Ann Spencer House is located, and it is the only historic district in Lynchburg that's recognized for the African-American people who live there, not for its architecture who not only made local, um, but national um, status. People like Dr. Rowan Johnson, who was the first African-American physician to practice at Lynchburg General Hospital. But instead of him planting a garden by the side of his house, he plants a tennis court 
<laughs> and who does E.J. train on the tennis court? Arthur Ashe, I bet. Say oh, I knew him. You said Virginia. Yes. And Althea, Althea Gibson, Gibson, too. Wow. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So it's a remarkable um, piece of history um, that has grown out of this earth on Pier Street, um, out of the dirt. You know, is the Ann Spencer House and Garden Museum and the Pier Street Renaissance Historic District. Wonderful. You know, when I, um, Zelda, your book Trinity has gotten a lot of great criticism about it. People seem to really like it. And you talk about generations mm -hmm. and healing. But in, in the book Trinity, you use gardens. Mm -hmm. Please explain, you know, how you do that and why you decided to do that in telling um, a history that goes back as far as what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. the Civil it, has, War. it has so much to do with what um, Sean was just um, talking about and what you were asking about with, uh, with reclaimed um, space. So there's ways in which we, we can reclaim um, damaged spaces outside of us and also inside of us. So sometimes when I, um, when I talk to, um, to, to folks, uh, a lot of times when I talk to people of color or black women about, you know, let's get our hands in the dirt or, or let's, let's get out there and grow some food or, um, or they're eating the food that I grew and they're like, how did this work? And I tell them about it and then there's like a, a child, I'll go glamping, but I won't go camping. Or a child, a <laughs> child, you know, my, you know, there was too much had to be healed for me to be out there in the fields, you know, and uh, all of those kinds of uh, poetic and funny statements. But um, but then what we, what I work with them uh, with is um, just the experience of what happens when you reclaim that, because it's like we were uh, we were people of the soil, um, which is people of the earth, which is people of the universe, uh, long before somebody had the really bad idea of slavery. Um, and so, um, so to reclaim uh, the the joy and the beauty and the food, medicine, and kinship of uh, being connected to the earth and in Trinity. Um, it's their stories and it is reconnecting to nature that is the healing force that the spirits that are in the book are trying to um, bring the family back to. And I love that, like in the very beginning of the book when we have the, um, the one uh, father who was abusive, who was um, born two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, um, he might be he might be a sharecropper and angry and doing what he has to do and for good reason uh, very caught caught in that violence, but at the same time there's the kitchen garden, and on some of the mornings that's where we see him go first, before he goes to the the sharecropping um, space where he will not. He can work that land, but, but it is not his to have any of it, which much like what we have with farmers now. And then we see throughout the book, I don't want to give anything away, but we do see um, the beauty of just daily. Somebody asked me uh, last week, why is there this slowdown right at the end of the book before some of the major stuff happens with the ending, where we've got this slowdown of the daily life of this character who has been who opens the story as a spirit but it, she's 20 something years old now in body and we get this slowdown so that we could get the beauty of this black woman's daily life with gardening that was her mother's and her mother's and her mother's 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 and gardening makes you slow down even when you didn't want to you know if you want to reap the benefits of that beauty you have to slow down don't you you know um I know we, we talk about Ann Spencer. We haven't talked about your grandfather, Edward, that much. And um, the only, I bring him up because it seems like they um, hopefully had a beautiful, romantic life. But I love when I read that he really built, he built the home, but he made a cottage for her so she could write and work, so she could just, you know, be and study her craft. And um, uh, maybe you can um, talk, is that, area still there and um, also so he I guess he just really understood the importance of it all I'm gonna try to get you a good picture that's the inside oh there we go we're getting there 
So this is the inside of Eden Crawl, but let me see if I can get you a picture of the, that's her writing desk. And that's photograph. you. One of those that's is you. That's me right there with my hands in the air with the arrow. <laughs> oh, my grandmother in the garden. I'm, I'm going to try. So this is the two of them. Maybe I'll stop here um, in the garden. Um, oops, getting too fast, getting too fast. Well, now you're going to get to see all the stuff. But anyway, here we go. That's a good one. So um, my grandfather built my grandmother a she shed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's what people call it today. Oh, I want a she shed. But um, this was, Eden Crawl is actually a combination of their names. And I'm so glad that you brought up my grandfather because my grandmother gets all the recognition for all of this. But my grandfather was just as much of a gardener as my grandmother. And he not only built this cottage, um, I first thought it was in the 1920s, but now I've found evidence that I think it's later in the 1940s. Um, and it's a one-room cottage, and it has uh, stone flooring, green stone flooring and um, windows that she can look out into the garden. Um, but she, with all these photographs, she didn't like to put a lot of photographs in the house, so she kept, this is how she kept them on the walls. But Edward got slack about building his wife her own space. I bet. In the 1940s. Women were not supposed to have their own space. Mm -hmm. And so men asked him, Hey man, what you, what, what's your wife going to be doing out there? You know, <laughs> kind of thing. And Edward says, gardening, and maybe writing a little poetry, maybe. Um, and so these men thought that the, that this woman was going to like overturn the world in her garden house. And um, Edward reassured them that no, she was not going to do too much change in the world. But boy, did she. Mm. Um, so my grandmother would write poetry. My father talked about my grandmother and my grandfather in this garden, late at night sometimes, um, probably before there were street lights, um, I, perhaps. But he would say that they would be out in the garden with a candle planting in the, at night sometimes. Um, and my grandmother would plant in the rain. She would, you know, she would write poetry in the cottage and then she you know, she may be inspired sometimes. I'm not sure whether she was in, it, the earth was inspiring her or, you know, how this was working, but you see a lot of nature in her poetry. Um, and she kind of uses that nature to, and Noel will talk more about that, to kind of overcome things, maybe even hide things, you know, mm -hmm. um, to make it kind of look flowery. And maybe part of that was for publication because they were not, you know, these women, black writers were, um, were not being published. But That's right. um, Edward built this house, he built the garden, he built the arbors and the pergolas. But guess what he's building it out of? Recycled materials. Upcycled materials. These people, you know, they lived in the Depression. They were using and saving everything. But it's when you come and you see it, or if you visit us online. Um, Did you say, he, was he a postal worker? He was a postal worker. And he would find so things along, along his, his route. Along his postal route, yes. he's delivering mail, but he's also picking up a broken chair or a mirror or something to bring into, into the house or the cottage or the garden. All the, all the turned posts came from somebody else's house in the garden. Yeah, they yeah. shouldn't have thrown it out there. <laughs> so I know we have to, I don't, I'm not sure of the time, but I know we have to, we want to open it up for questions. And one thing hopefully all of us have learned from Ann Spencer is that I, um, that she was self-taught and she worked through trial and error, you know, like if mm -hmm. something didn't work or didn't blend well, you know, she just changed it. And so I guess that's a lesson for all of us in trying to make our spaces beautiful. Yeah, so um, she and my grandfather, this is, I'm, I'm getting, this is a really large perspective, but she and my grandfather would go out on Sundays after church with a shovel and dig up plants they wanted to put in their garden. 
Um, don't do that today. You'll go to jail. Um, but, and so what Noel was saying, I'm trying to get to the end of this, because um, I wanted to show you all this letter that Dr. Um, Kendrick was bringing up. This is Sterling Brown, my grandmother. This is Jane White, responsible for the garden. So our garden is restored by an all-white club um, in Lynchburg. They have restored this garden twice, and um, they've won two Commonwealth Awards for their restoration work. This arbor and pergola that I've been showing you um, cost over $100,000 to restore. Um, this is, I'm trying to get someplace, but I don't know where I'm trying to get to. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to show you this letter and some of these you're going to see. Is that Mary McLeod Bethany? That is. Yeah. So I wanted to get to the Garden Club stuff. So um, in, in talking about the white, can I just go off for a second? Yes. Okay. Can the Hillside Garden Club that was restored in this garden, so now I'm in this garden world, this real garden world, other than just having a garden at my own house, you know, husband that I like to do. Now I'm really, I'm in this garden world trying to figure out who is a garden conservancy, who's the garden club of Virginia, who's the garden club of America, who is all these garden people. Um, but in my grandmother's papers, I come across this piece, this paper, and it was about a garden club meeting in Lynchburg. And so I go to the white garden club members, Hillside Garden Club, and I say, hey, there are white garden clubs here. Were there black garden clubs here? Nobody could tell me anything about that. And so I do some research on my own, and it takes me years, and finally I come across the Virginia Garden Club, um, the, the Negro Garden Club um, handbook. But when I came across this, um, it, it, it made me think about, was my grandmother a member of a garden club? Was she, or was she just at this garden club meeting? So it wasn't enough information to tell me that. But once I came across the handbook, I don't know if I'm going the right way with this thing. Um, uh, this is the letter I'm looking for. Once I came across the, um, the handbook, I found out that not only was my grandmother a member of this garden club, Edward was a member of the garden club. <laughs> Good. And there were these, this garden club was named the Progressive Garden Club. And they were so progressive, they had men in the club. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I, I was trying to find this letter before we, we end, but I just want to have it. I don't know if you want me to speak to it right now, because that, um, this woman, you can't see her name down here in the corner, probably because of my head, but Maddie Hall Zuma. Oh, yes. Um, you all know her, mm -hmm. North Carolinians. And Dr. Kendrick wrote a book about her. And, um, and it wasn't until Carter Q sent me information about Maddie Hall Zuma and connected me to Dr. Kendrick. Um, and then I remembered this odd woman's name, Maddie Hall Zuma. And I was like, hmm. And so I had to take my assistant up to UVA um, to do some research in the papers. And so while I was there, I was like, you know, it seemed to me that I saw it in somewhere in papers. I don't know if it's the papers at, at our museum or at, the, at UVA. So I asked them, I asked for the index, and there was Maddie Hall Zuna, something in the index from her to Ann Spencer. And this is the letter. And... Um, Gardening and activism went together this is the so, um, but Zuma. what I want so so this is saying that she and um, she talks about Asa Sims coming to the club in North Carolina um, from Hampton Institute, um, and she talks about people that she knows in Lynchburg, but she talks about Ann Spencer as a gardener and as a activist an advocate um, in their connection with the YWCA. So I would just, um, Dr. Kendrick wanted to know if I had the letter and I told her I would share it. But this, when I saw this, it was, it's just another connection. These women, um, and, and she was a link, I mean, she was connected to, these women are so interconnected with each other and they're so multi-layered that you, 
that I, I think it was probably easy for our families or people's families or for people when they're going through your things when you have passed on to think that this little garden catalog or garden letter, oh, we can just throw that away, you know? But this is a part of their life and connected them to, the, to many different black women and women and just African-American um, organizations and committees like the Lynx, like the YWCA, like these, uh, the Federation of Garden Clubs. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's just I, I don't think we'll ever finish our research because there's so much that we don't know and that still needs to be uncovered, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to thank you ladies for being here today. It's just an enlightening conversation. I learned a lot. I hope you all did too. And if there are a couple of questions, uh, I guess we can look at, we can go by sections. First of all, any, sex, any questions from the balcony? <laughs> we'll bring some love up there. You guys fine? Can you raise your hand. Well, what about someone here? Yeah. Oh, okay. They're coming with the mic. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I also I was wondering, since you mentioned that the people who funded the re uh, the the garden and like fixing it up and helping, they were all white. Do you feel like that's a good thing or a bad thing and why? Is it like a form of repatriation for the, the horrible things that have happened in this country due to white people? And do you think that that should be something that we're all more involved in? I, 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 well, I, I'll tell you that um, I, I did hear a couple of comments from Garden Club members. Um, these are all educated women. And these are women who grew up in Lynchburg. So they were there in the 50s. They were there in the 60s. Um, they were embarrassed that they did not know about this woman who lived on the other side of town. It wasn't that she was a black woman. They were, it was because she was a gardener. They were embarrassed because they didn't know who this woman was that lived on the other side of town. And so I, I I, I can't go in their heads, but I, from their comments, I think it's, it's, it's about gardening. It's about just, you know, and that's, I think, how my grandmother was in her garden. She accepted all people there. It wasn't, you know, even though she lived in an African-American community, if people wanted to come and, and meet James Weldon Johnson or Langston Hughes, they found out, they read in the black newspaper that he, that he was coming to town or whatever, they, they ring the doorbell, come to the garden, they would let him in. So it wasn't, I don't think for them it's a black or white thing, and I, it was never a black or white thing for my grandmother. It's, it was, it's just about gardening. These women, it's just a love of nature and what we've heard already today of what it does for you, right? Yes, it can save yeah. you. We have a question, another question in this section. Uh, Sean, I wanted to thank you for putting that letter up. Um, uh, I'm Wanda Hendricks, and I wrote the biography of Mady Hall Zuma. Um, and one of my graduate students actually told me about the letter. I had no idea it existed. But I want you all to look at the corner, the top corner, and notice that it's from Johannesburg, South Africa. Yes. Africa. Um, and so the transnational nature of it. Um, and also, Mady Halzuma, as you, uh, if you looked at your program, was the first president of the North Carolina Federation of Flower Clubs, so, uh, or Garden Clubs, I'm sorry, uh, and those members who came in uh, this morning with their flag, um, as well as uh, their, the song uh, of the club uh, as well. So I learned a lot doing this, uh, doing this book biography of her, and as I said, it's the first biography of her. And at first, I was not going to put the garden clubs. Sean knows this. I told her <laughs> this while we were uh, at the bed and breakfast that I was never going to put the garden clubs in there. I wasn't going to put any of her other talents uh, in there as well. And then quickly realized that that's who she was. 
that it was very important to her, and then discovered this relationship uh, 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 with your grandmother, um, which tells me how active they really were. And you're exactly right. All of these women were very connected all across um, the southeast, uh, going uh, north, as well as all across the nation. And Abra has, has shown me that. I didn't realize that. I thought they were just little sort of state garden clubs or individual local garden clubs, and they were not. They were connected to people all across the country. Um, so uh, it, it is much broader than any of us ever realized. Um, and I'm very uh, happy that you talked about the activism and all the people who came through Ann Spencer's uh, life and stayed at her home. So. Mm. And thank you for Zuma's book. Yeah. You know, it, it, absolutely. Oh my goodness. <laughs> It's like these, these women were smart enough to kind of have this if, secret society that the right people knew about. You know, it wasn't really a secret. But yeah. it, also, we haven't mentioned my grandmother was a librarian. <laughs> but, um, and here we connect to Carter Q for having us here today. Um, but she, that was her job from 1924 to 1945. She was the first library, African-American librarian in the city of Lynchburg at the um, all-black Dunbar High School. That makes sense because, you know, libraries are like pollinators. It's like, you know, where, where it's like all the little bees come and they get the <laughs> pollen and then they take the pollen all I over. I love that, I love that. Any more questions, Ira? We're on time. Oh. We're out of time. <laughs> I didn't even look over here. Yeah, we're out oh, of this, time. this one lady. Ben. There you go. <laughs> Just really quickly, um, it makes me very sad to know that there are other Ann Spencers around this country who aren't being recognized in this way and their gardens have been destroyed or what have you. Um, are there efforts currently to discover these other gardens and to renovate them, or how can we? Um, get involved in identifying where these gardens are so that maybe we can have some grassroots efforts to um, To make a restoration of those gardens Well, I hope so. I hope yeah. that some type of directory is being made I, I don't know if there's well. I think that um, Abra probably has the largest um, collection of those but you know of, of of, and she's going to talk about that in her talk coming up, that it's, it's kind of gone across the country. But I think it's going to take each one of us in our own places, wherever that is, cities, states, to recognize the people that you know um, in those states and, and um, you know, recognize them um, and say, hey, this garden, if you're just driving by, I drive, drive around all the time in Lynchburg and I go in the, you know, I always take the back streets. My mother said, always, how do you know all the shortcuts? But, um, you know, and you get to see these kind of hidden urban gardens, the people that are, it's beautiful. That, and I'm not right by there, and I was like, you know, just recently, to your uh, point, um, that, God, these, we need to have a black garden day in Lynchburg. We need to recognize some of these black people that are taking care of their gardens, There's, you know, that, um, in some way. And so, you know, who knows, but when I, when I got the, um, first came across the handbook the, the, um, from Hampton, the Virginia Handbook of Negro Garden Clubs, I, there were seven in Lynchburg, and I got in my car, I couldn't wait. I just rode around to those addresses to see what was left, and there was nothing left. So get a hold of that. If you're in, I mean, if you're in Virginia, that's the handbook. If you're in North Carolina, there may be something else wherever you are. Find out who these garden clubs were, where they were, where these people lived, and go and see what's left. My grandmother's garden was overgrown. Overgrown, and they, had to, they came in with a bulldozer and, sh and shook out bulbs, tulips, yeah. uh, narcissuses, and roses were all entangled, but they saved what they could, and it's all planted there still. But, you know, and some of it is plants that she would have, we know that she would have had in her garden just from her, um, her archives. But go and do it. Do the, you, got, you have to do the work. Yeah, and can I add yeah. something real quick? The other thing that I would say is to um, 
because the ways that I've been inspired today are, are reminded to you know, use the capacity that I have as a human in physical form to do the work, the ancestral work, is when you are presented uh, with, with something or you're in a moment where someone shows you something. I was in Mississippi at the Mississippi Book Festival and they took all the authors to the Eudora Welty house and everybody seemed happy afterwards, but I was, I was not happy because I was like, where's the Margaret Walker house? Where did, where did Alice Walker live when she was here in Jackson, Mississippi? And I was like, how come, you know, we're not talking about that. We went to one person's house. And then I, whenever I have a complaint, I try to look for the solution because, you know, I, I figure there's a, a, a yin to the yang. And then um, the woman who wrote the biography of the Margaret Walker um, book, I was at the reception and she said, what's your name? How are you doing? I said, what's your name? How are you doing? And, uh, you know, we all got name tags on. And she, um, she said, I'm not doing that great. I went on a tour today, and I was like, me too. And she said, um, and I said, can I tell you what I was upset about? And I told her, and she said, me too. And she goes, because I wrote, I wrote Margaret Walker's biography, and I had done a lot, but there's more to be done because her house, no one is paying attention to her house. And I said, can you please take me to where it is? So we went, and... Um, and it's been nagging me the way ancestral stuff, spirit stuff will nag you until you do what you're supposed to do. It's been nagging me that she showed me this house um, and I had a conversation with her on the phone and everything afterwards and we emailed each other and she said, but I'm tired. And so what I realized it is my job to do, and so I'm saying this to all of us, is when you are presented with something, however it is that you're presented with it, is to, uh, is to turn your attention toward that path of restoration and of doing the thing that will help to bring forth and, and will hold on to. And I'm just, I just want to like touch you, Sean, because it's like you're, 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 you're Ann Spencer's granddaughter, you're sitting right here, you're in body, you're doing this work, and the ways in which we can be inspired you know, from you to do to do what we know to do, to do what we are called to do. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and before we go, one last word from Noel. <laughs> Sorry, this is quick, I promise. But I mean, from Alice Walker's In Search of Our Mother's Gardens to Camille Dungy's book Soil, which is out there, you know, it, it, there, there is so much to think about that is palpable, that's tactile, that we can ask each other. There is maybe potential here for some of the technology that we now live with, right? Um, I think of the work that's done on Zora Neale Hurston at this point using uh, location technology, you know, kind of GPS system and trying to recreate that kind of tactile walk through her world of Eatonville right, in Florida. So I, it, it does require the continuity that a garden demands of us, kind of con continuity and consistency. Can I, before you do, can I add on to what you were just saying about not recognizing and acknowledging the work and so much work that has been done. Right now, there is underway for Mady Hall Zuma, one of our own, to get a historic designation in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It did not receive, it did not, it was not accepted this year. But what that does is provide the opportunity to draw more energy so we can practically apply some of the things that we have been talking about and what Dr. Hendricks' biography, and it's, she's an incredible woman. I had a chance to go with Carter Q down for that hearing and also to see the property. Um, we have an opportunity to be able to actually practically apply some of the things that we've been talking about in support because there's no way in the world that this woman should be unknown. Mm -hmm. So thank you again uh, for everything. I'll let you close it out. No, just thank you, Sean, um, Spencer Hester, and Dr. Zelda Lockhart, and Dr. Noel Morissette. It's been lovely. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. We're gonna reconvene at two o'clock. There is lunch for sale in the lobby uh, by Palace International. 
and there's room to sit in the cafeteria. We'll reconvene at 2 o'clock. Thank you again, Betty Jenkins, for the beautiful floral displays.
sure did. So I, my sound works. <laughs> okay, wonderful.
Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, your time, your energy, your effort. This has been a great day so far. We have one last session, but before we do that, um, as you can see, there's every person that's been on stage, every person that's been in this building, there's been a lot of work done behind the scenes. And there's one person that this would not be possible without the visionary, Carter Q, are you in here? Please. Yes, we were talk. Hello, Carter. We we're talking about the visionary that made this all possible. Please let him know how much we appreciate this. Thank you again. And to introduce our presenter, we'll have Kavana Anderson, who is the Director of Learning and Community Engagement at Sarah P. Duke Gardens. Thank you again. Hello. What an incredible day this has been, as everyone has said. These flowers by Ms. Betty Jenkins, all of the wisdom we've heard from elders and passed down by ancestors learning different ways to be in relationship with plants. Um, I am so excited to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Georgia native, Abra Lee. Um, she is a horticulturist who developed a passion for uncovering and sharing stories of black Americans and their contributions to the industry and the American landscape. Growing up, listening to personal accounts from her grandparents and family members, Abra was inspired by generations who came before her. She saw a need to retell the stories of the inspiring lives of black men and women who have accomplished careers in the plant world, and we're so grateful that she's here to share these with us today. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Fine Gardening, Veranda Magazine, and on National Public Radio, among many other places. Uh, she's a graduate of Auburn University and an alumna of the Longwood Garden Society of Fellows, which is a global network of public horticultural professionals. She's director of horticulture at Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta, and that's where she's visiting from today. Thank you so much for being here, and I can't wait for us to hear from you and learn from you. Thank you all so much for having me today. It was, it's my first time in Durham. I'm embarrassed to say that, but it certainly won't be my last. And with the introduction that Kavana just gave, I um, start, my mom was a historian. She was a high school teacher. She taught um, black history, American history, world history in black high schools in Atlanta. And when I was 27 years old, I was appointed as landscape manager of Hartsfield Jackson, Atlanta International Airport. And um, Oh, I, <laughs> thank you, but I was sharing that because I was so young and I couldn't believe I had gotten this position and I felt imposter syndrome. And it wasn't because I was black or a woman, it was because of my age at 27. And my mom asked me, she said, do you think you're the first black person that's been the horticulturist or uh, landscape director for an airport? And I said, yeah, I do, because this was 2007 maybe, I think is when it was. And she said, well, who do you think did the airport at Tuskegee? Do, don't you think they had an <laughs> airport director for the Tuskegee Airmen that did the air I was like, oh my gosh, she's right. So she started introducing me to some of the people um, that I'm going to introduce you all today. And as I would go out and talk about plants and airports, people were more interested in hearing these stories than they were about the airports in general. So, yeah. <laughs> so with that, we're going to go on and get started. And I tried to uh, make sure I included a lot of North Carolina representation today. Um, and I want to say one more thing before I start. If we're talking about, so my background is ornamental horticulture, decorative, beautification, just like the garden club. So I say that because there is no discussion in the United States without South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. Y'all are the trifecta of the influence of ornamental gardening and American gardening in that style. So you are in a very special place. If, sometimes I long to be from one of those three states, being from Georgia with more of a farming background, but truly, 
for Black Garden History, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina are the trifecta, and y'all will see that today. So I wanna start here. This is a gentleman named Billy Hunt, William Lanier Hunt. Some of y'all know that name, uh, a well-known North Carolina horticulturist, a white man. And Billy Hunt, um, in the 1940s, he uh, was discussing in the newspaper and giving um, some information and, and doing his lectures. And when he was referencing the black gardeners uh, who preserved many of the rare old flowers, the heirloom plants that we still have today, these camellias, these roses, some of these azaleas, Billy Hunt said this from Pomona, North Carolina. I hope I said that right. When the war was over and old homes were burned or deserted, their gardens were ruined, but the former slaves had taken cuttings and roots that had come originally from England and the continent, from old Spain, for instance, and planted them in their little plots. They have some magnificent rare flowers. And he had come across these gardens in rural cabinets in Mississippi, and with that, two things can be true. So the horrors of bondage and slavery. So in the South, the Civil Wars occurred, South is burned to the ground, and formerly enslaved people returning to those plantations to get their plants, the plants that they cared for, things that were beautiful to them, their roses, their garden. So when um, earlier today, and I'm so sorry, I can't remember the name, the, uh, the, the professor or that had come from FAMU that was hosting Sean's panel, and she mentioned the HBCUs, and I heard someone say, that the American South is a garden. So it's so true. And we have to thank formerly enslaved people for saving these heirloom plants from people who weren't able to go back to those former plantations. And another part to that, so this is Billy Hunt here, but this is a famous picture from um, the Library of Congress of a woman named um, Aunt Phoebe. I say Aunt in air quotes, because at the time black women weren't, elder black women weren't um, acknowledged with honorific titles like Mrs. or, or Madam. And she is a woman that was formerly enslaved at the Magnolia Gardens and Plantation in Charleston, South Carolina, owned by the Drayton family, still owned by them to this day. But when Mrs. Phoebe and other formerly enslaved people were brought back on, they were brought back on after the Civil War, no longer enslaved, but called tour guides at that garden. And in reality, these are the type of plants that Mrs. Phoebe was pointing out on her tours native rhododendrons, uh, sweet shrubs, spireas, the jessamines, the magnolias, the palms, the Spanish moss. And if you've ever been to Magnolia, it is uh, a place where the formerly enslaved created and dug out the land, but to call her a tour guide is a disservice. This is really what a plants woman looks like, and um, an autodidactic horticulturist, a self-taught horticulturist. And it's easy to be dismissive of her because she is in a service uniform and she is a dark-skinned black woman and she does have her hair tied up. So we have to rethink what a true horticulturist is. And Kavana mentioned me um, having a background where I go down to my family's farm, learn plants. And though I went to Auburn and got a formal horticulture education, my mom was very clear that I would never be able to out horticulture or out agriculture, my grandmama's, you know, brothers and sisters, so don't ever get it twisted. So these are, to me, the, the true horticulturists of America. And this is a George IV rose um, at the end, and it was a rose that thought, thought to be um, gone forever, but it was found in an old black cemetery in South Carolina. So thank you, black people, <laughs> for saving a rose. Okay, so I talked about... Um, People like Miss Phoebe, Aunt Phoebe in South Carolina, and I want to talk about um, formally trained black women. So at breakfast uh, this morning with Dr. Wandra Hendricks and Sean Spencer Hester, we were, of course, talking about Tuskegee. And to give you all some context, Auburn and Tuskegee are literally on the same street, literally 15 miles apart on a, a, a road in Alabama. And the woman that you see in the circle here, that is Margaret Murray Washington. Um, she was a classmate of W.E.B. Du Bois, Dr. W.B. Du Bois, great friend of Ann Spencer, and also the third wife of Booker T. Washington. And I say that because in 1899, Mrs. Washington, Booker T. Washington, most famous for being the first black president of a historically black college or university, take a trip to a place called Swanley Horticultural College in England. And there it is an all girls school and they witness women with a formal landscape curriculum. And so Mrs. Washington brings this idea back to Tuskegee. And that's important because Tuskegee is a school that is built by the students and you are expected to bring that knowledge back into your community. 
So with that, this is a three semester course that Mrs. Washington puts together for the women's school. She's the president of the Tuskegee Women's College. And I, I wanna share with y'all a sample of some of that curriculum. These women, this is a picture from a book called Working with the Hands. It was the second autobiography of Booker T. Washington. And the picture is called Outdoor Work for Women. They were learning a study of outdoor yards and how to utilize and beautify them. Floriculture and landscape gardening layering, grafting, and cuttings of plants, which is plant propagation, uh, harmony of color, form, and size of flowers, and then another one that I pulled out, and again, this is a three-semester catalog, so I just pulled out a few out of the, I think, about 30 different um, choices they were learning. This one has always stood out to me, laying out of private and public grounds, roads, parks, walks, and streets. And when you're educated in that, and there's a young lady here from North Carolina a and that's what we call landscape architecture, when you're learning how to lay out parks, grounds, roads, and streets. So I am not saying that any of these women went on to be landscape architects. I am saying that they did go back in their communities, and they were the garden club mentors, and they were the sisters, and the mothers, and the aunts, and the friends that understood how to lay out paths, that understood how to hold the county accountable because the road wasn't right. So we do have to acknowledge their work as well. And the forward vision thinking of someone like Margaret Murray Washington, who was a brilliant woman in her own right. Now, I want to talk about, uh, we're still at Tuskegee because I wanted to make sure we talk about HBCUs today, and truly North Carolina has a rich history of that. This is a gentleman named uh, Alfred F. Crawford, Alfred Crawford. And in 1900, on August 23rd, 1900, he was giving a speech at what was then called the National Negro Business League Conference. If you hear me say the word Negro today, I'm referencing the word black historically. Um, so just wanted to acknowledge that. And he was given a speech at 10 a.m. in the morning to talk about his work as a floriculturist. He says, ladies and gentlemen, I am not a public speaker. It is out of my line of business entirely. If I were called on to plant a small rhododendron or a great tree 100 feet high, and requiring six oxen to do it, I could undertake it because that, that is my business. So the confidence of Mr. Alfred F. Crawford here, who was born in Hayesville, North Carolina, left there at the age of 14 because he um, was promised by his uncle he would get an education in Alabama. So even at the age of five, Alfred Crawford is picking up wood chips, he's planting flowers, he has this really, um, he, he's working as a child and has this exposure to horticulture so when he comes to Alabama, uh, his uncle did not actually put him in an educational situation. He um, had him um, be hired as a butler, as a young man. And he worked at a woman's house and she noticed his interest in plants. And this is a white woman. And so she built a greenhouse for him. So eventually uh, he leaves Montgomery, Alabama. The business that he's working with, he's no longer but butler, is sold. And he moves to Meriden, Connecticut. Meriden, Connecticut. And when he gets to Connecticut, um, he starts to establish a life there. He's working for the general store and the old motel or hotel is coming down one day and the windows, just like you see here, are being torn out and he asked the person, can he have them? And he doesn't have any money, but he says, I'll haul them away for you. And when he does that, he takes them back and builds his own greenhouses. And this is what you see here in these ads are the greenhouses of Alfred F. Crawford. This is a gentleman who goes on to uh, in 1903, become a professor at Tuskegee University. So I haven't found exactly if that was the first meeting with him in Booker T. Washington in 1900, but they certainly met there. He goes on to have a, um, a lead classes there during the time that Margaret Murray Washington is also there with the women um, during her class. And this is just a list. A lot of times people say, well, what were black people growing during that time? So in 1903, these are some of the, the plants that were um, of interest in hot cellars at the Crawford Nursery. Calla, cal, calla lilies, violets, hyacinths, uh, narcissus or daffodils, carnations, begonias, chrysanthemums, sweet peas, I could go on and on. And the interest of beautification in ornamental horticulture has always been there. And Sean alluded to this earlier, but what's very interesting about Ann Spencer and her life and legacy is her seeing beauty as a quality of life issue for black people, no different than access to uh, fresh water, access to healthy food. So never feel like you have to apologize or feel like beauty isn't 
like top three priority in your life. It should be, it must be, especially for us. And it is wonderful that women like Ann Spencer in the Harlem Renaissance and then other black women and growers, which we'll see later today, prioritize that because they understood every day isn't about fighting a good fight. And I think that's also why our ancestors went back to those plantations and got their beautiful plants out the ground and grew them. Alfred Crawford also grew um, flowering shrubs such as rhododendrons, hydrangeas, azaleas, um, crimson rambler roses, and snowballs. And he also uh, would create floats for the, uh, the parades up there. So he would create a float with a greenhouse on it with all these flowers. And another interesting thing when you do this research, though I'm researching trying to really understand their horticulture careers, you find out their hobbies. And he was a champion croquet player and had his own croquet field. So that's really uh, interesting. This has been the only picture I've ever been able to find of him, um, an illustration in a paper. So Carter, we got work to do. We got to find his photograph from 1903. So I mentioned Margaret Murray Washington is there. I mentioned Alfred Crawford's at Tuskegee. And this gentleman here is David Augustus Williston. So regardless of the complicated relationship of, of Booker T. Washington to the black community, loved or hated, um, he built the dream team at Tuskegee. He really did. This is just three people I'm talking about that are part of this landscape horticulture ornamental gardening le legacy. So David Augustus Williston from Fayetteville, North Carolina, um, was the first African-American to graduate from Cornell University, the Ivy League school, with a degree in ornamental horticulture. With that, he is hired, makes his way down to Tuskegee, and is hired and works under George Washington Carver and is a lifelong friend of his for 28 years. And so that's another important thing to point out about the HBCUs, the fact that during the Great Depression, all these really um, tough financial times, not just tough social times in America, black people keeping other black people employed through these wonderful institutions that are the HBCUs. David Augustus Willison, this is a picture of the Oaks, which is the home of Booker T. Washington. It still stands at Tuskegee today. And this is, uh, the people on the front row can see it better, but this is an example of some of his plantings. So he designed the landscape for the home. I have been by that home within the past 12 months. It does not look like that anymore. Um, and Sean talked about that. We're talking about restoring landscapes, so we got a picture. So we can, we do have an idea of what the oaks look like uh, during Booker T. Washington's lifetime. Now it's just grass and, and shrubs there. But also he laid out the alleys, so the, the, the tree-lined sidewalks at Tuskegee. He laid out parts of Florida A&M University, parts of Tennessee State University, parts of Fisk University. This is a gentleman that lived into his 90s and worked as a landscape architect up until that time in the 1960s. He also, not just being employed by Booker T. Washington, but also had a, a warm relationship and was a fan of W.B. Du Bois as well. So the intellectualism here, this gentleman was a mathematician. He was a member of the New York Botanic Garden, a member of the American Forestry Society. So sometimes we forget when we're talking about our ancestors, they were members of very, um, very established organizations that still exist today. So even though they may not have been able to attend the monthly meetings, they were still receiving the mailers and able to get that informa information to educate our communities. And he was also, I wanna point out, he was also a student of a gentleman named Liberty Hyatt Bailey, who was considered the father of American horticulture, uh, the great horticulturist, Liberty Hyatt Bailey. So there is a gentleman named uh, Drek Spurlock Wilson, who is a, a legendary black landscape architect who is working on a book about the life and legacy and the relationship and friendship of David Augustus Williston and George Washington Carver. So look out for that in the future. And now I want to talk about, um, this is one of my favorite pictures ever. This is also from the Library of Congress. So I think if you type in flower sellers on the Library of Congress, you'll see it. But this is from 1865. Yes, 1870, June of 1870, uh, Harper's Weekly. And Harper's Weekly is still a publication, I believe is in publication still today, I think it's digital now. But this was an artist who captured on that summer day the black flower sellers in downtown Washington, D.C. And these are black women who brought their flowers in, would lay them out in front of the Potomac River, brought them in by horse and buggy on carriage, and when they brought their flowers in, they brought them in pots, they brought them in baskets. So to just call them flower sellers is doing them a disservice. These are, this is really a mobile nurseries. That's what that is. And I think that another part 
of when we're talking about black garden history, we have to name the things that we, that we see. Just like Miss Phoebe, a tour guide is not what she was. These weren't just flower sellers. These are what floriculturists look like. This is what community looks like. This is their display, and thank God someone had the idea to capture it. This is black women still holding on to their Africanisms with their hair tied up, very similar to what we would see gay lays in, in West Africa, things like that. These are beautiful dark-skinned black women. So building community, building their own wealth, free black women, and understanding that flowers was their means to economic and financial freedom. Um, so the relationship with black women and flowers has been a very long and very strong one. And I always say, if you Google flower farmers, even right now, if you pulled out your phone, this wouldn't come up, probably not even that many black women, if any, but we have been flower farmers for a very, very long time on the land that we own. And this was land that they owned in Virginia and would bring back to downtown Washington, D.C. So a very powerful and beautiful picture of this capture from the flower sellers in the market in Washington. So I want to talk about um, one of the things in the um, write-up that Carter did so beautifully for this presentation was to talk about not just flower growers, flower sellers, but commercial work done by African Americans. So this is a gentleman named Peyton DeWitt from my home, the great state of Georgia, and he makes his way up to Pennsylvania as an eight-year-old. This is a black man. He identified as a black man in his lifetime. I know he's light-skinned, y'all. <laughs> he almost looks white, but I promise you, in every sense, he, he talks about uh, being black. And he was a person who was, at one point, one of the most successful horticulturists in the United States. Uh, by November of 1913, his business here in Pennsylvania, these are his conservatories where he grew. He was most famous for growing carnations, but he had a full-on nursery. And here you can see the, the length and how large of these conservatories were. And they were so, he was so good at what he did, his work made it into the Crisis Magazine, um, the official magazine of the NAACP and uh, where W.E.B. Du Bois is one of the founders and also the editors of the Crisis Magazine. He had 30 acres of land on his property here in Pennsylvania where he um, built his commercial carnation um, uh, nurseries here. He had eight greenhouses, which were 150 feet by 20 feet. So a very huge operation. And between October and June, he was shipped between 500 to 1,000 uh, chrysanthemums to Philadelphia daily. And I just left Philadelphia, uh, was part of the flower show this year. And one thing I wanted to note about Peyton DeWitt, there is a, a, a carnation called the Pennsylvania carnation that was uh, cultivated by Mr. Peyton DeWitt here. It is a dark pink carnation, and it is one that now the Philadelphia, um, uh, Pennsylvania Horticulture Society, Philadelphia Flower Show, they're gonna work with me to try to relocate this carnation. So even the plants that we have cultivated over time get lost in the narrative. So we've been doing this work, but if we don't reshare these stories, then it does get lost. So it's pretty exciting that this was done. And he had huge sales from this specific Carnation, and if you all know anything about it, please, we would love to share, because we want to try to find it just like the George Rose, uh, George the Fourth Rose was found as well. Now, I wanted to go back to the flower sellers, um, particularly these flower sellers. This is in um, Richmond, Virginia. So I would say, remember I was, I'd said that North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia are the, certainly the trifecta of ornamental horticulture. In terms of flower sellers, arguably Charleston is gonna be the most famous but it was um, back in the fall, I had gone to Richmond, I was at an event, Sean came by to see me, and I was doing research on flower sellers, and at one point, Richmond was considered a city of flowers. That was literally the nickname of Richmond, because people f driving from the north down to the south, so people coming from New York down to Florida, would stop in Richmond for the night, just so they could be in touch with and contact with an exchange and purchase flowers from the black women flower sellers in downtown Richmond. So they weren't coming to see the monuments on Monument Row, they were coming to see these women. And the reason I love this picture is because black flowers, besides economic freedom for black women, it has allowed black women to bring their children to work. And that is something that can be very hard to do. In, I don't have children, but I work with many women that do in horticulture. Even the, the Longwood Fellowship that I've done, it's very hard to do that with children. So flowers have meant freedom even for black families for such a long time. So Flower Vendors Row, it started uh, longer than anyone can ever even remember when it started. And with that, these are women that grew their own flowers in Henrico County in Virginia. And the reporter that wanted to document them 
about their flowers, how they were bringing them downtown, establishing this great clientele, the women wouldn't take them back to their farms. So I also like the idea of the protection and the privacy of their land and not wanting to, to share their secrets publicly. But the women also became almost too successful for their own good. So a, a tale as old as time, when we talk about the highways being built through black communities, the women were eventually um, charged with being uh, harassing on the streets or littering or being a nuisance to the public. You can clearly see this is a non-nuisance to the public. So they got too successful for their own good. They were charged with not having a business license. And so their flower seller powers were stripped away. And this happened from Richmond to Memphis to Charleston. And clearly they couldn't get a business license because they were black women during that time. So um, this is a business that we've been a part of. And the young lady who um, was the flower farmer on the first um, panel this morning, I see why your soul was called to that because this is what our ancestors did. And I want to read a, a, a little passage from the reporter um, who was in uh, Richmond, Virginia that day recording the women. She said, every blossom which ever grew in Virginia gardens may be seen in this market. Each flower is grown before the humble doorways of cabins within a few miles of the spot where they are sold. They're selling daylilies, day lilies, dahlias, marigolds, lilacs, lavenders, pinks, and pansies each trying to vie for public favor with sweet peas, sweet williams, cornflowers, and coreopsis. So just the range of flowers, and this is just an excerpt. And when these women showed up to the market with their flowers uh, on the weekends, and sometimes during the week, this is when the butterflies, so when the women arrive, so at the butterflies as well. So just a beautiful scene that you can imagine with uh, at least 100 seller, uh, flower seller, sellers in downtown Richmond. And finally, she said this, they turn bunching of flowers into a fine art, evidenced by their perfect symmetry, bunch, bunching bachelor's buttons so that they were slightly raised in a center like a cauliflower. So just even the artisanship of knowing how to bunch those flowers so perfectly that they're matching at the top and then wrapping them in string and paper. It's hard to see in this picture, but the last thing I want to point out is that they brought their flowers in wash pans, lard cans, all kind of tins, and they were chastised about that. But now people, we call that shabby chic and upcycling and recycling and repurposes. So we have a hand in it making that cool as well. And people charge you for these things now. It's crazy. They'll recreate uh, the old things to make them new. So um, you've heard the name Carter Q today and never forget the name. This is one of the things that bonded us together for life. The story of Annie Mae Van Reed, originally from Cuomo. North Carolina, I hope I'm saying that right, Carter, I think so, um, on the Virginia-North Carolina border. So this is a woman like myself, I consider her a legacy child of horticulture and agriculture. So my mom's family grew up on a farm. We returned to that farm on the weekends growing up. My dad was director of parks for the city of Atlanta when I was a child. So if I wasn't in the parks during the week, I was on the dirt road country on the weekend. Annie Mae Van Reed's uh, family owned land um, in North Carolina and also in Virginia, about 1,000 acres of land. And she was a school teacher who made her way to Darlington, South Carolina. And while in Darlington, as a teacher, she started growing her own flowers. So you see a theme here of black women in flowers today. And she was so great at it that people would just stop by and ask, they get a bunch, and she was generous and, and would give flowers to people. But eventually, she saw that she had a business opportunity there because there was no floral shop or greenhouse in Darlington. Darlington, um, to give you context, is just up the road from Bishopsville, South Carolina, made most famous by the topiary artist Pearl Fryer. And this is one of Annie Mae Van Reed's favorite quotes. She says, the florist whose beautiful shop you pass is to the soul of man and woman what the restaurant keeper is to the stomach. And the feeding of the soul is as important as any other kind of feeding. So again, beauty and it being a, a, a quality of life issue. This is feeding your soul. The work that I do with these flowers, these plants, is that. So Annie Mae Van Reed really makes a name for herself. In 1949, she appears in Ebony Magazine with other famous black women, floriculturists of the time. And she had, by that time, built a five-acre nursery and greenhouse. Um, and another thing I want to point out, you can kind of see it. At the top, it says, Mrs. Annie M. Reed Flores. So remember I talked about Aunt Phoebe in air quotes. Mrs. Annie Mae Van Reed, you weren't going to get it twisted in her town. She wasn't your auntie or your Annie. She was to be respected as a Mrs. or uh, a very formal title. 
And I've met people, I've met her, her uh, nieces who remember her, and they said she was a wonderful woman, but she was very serious about you addressing her very properly. And another thing I always talk about, I love her in this fur coat in Darlington, South Carolina, because you don't actually need a fur coat <laughs> in Darlington. But she's so rich, and she is that girl, and she's like, I'm bringing out my fur coat, Ebony is here, let's do it. So, love it, love that fur, this is a flex, that's what the key is called, a flex. So, it is okay to flex when you have done what you need to do. Um, and this is another flex, her 1940 Ford floral delivery van with her, you know, like, I'm gonna pose for this picture. So, this is a woman that was truly, truly legendary in her town, and this is a woman who had a almost 50-year career in floriculture, so I don't wanna just be dismiss dismissive as if she only had a five-acre nursery and greenhouse. She also sold potted plants, um, she sold uh, uh, artistic emblems, she sold baskets, she sold, um, ferns, geraniums, seeds, et cetera. So to say that she just had a greenhouse, what she really had is what we call a garden center today in Darlington, and she had two locations. And this is another quote from the very confident Annie Mae Van Reed. She says, I knew I was hitting the top when mail orders came from the governor's mansion at Columbia and from cities as far north as Boston. So it is okay to pat yourself on the back, black women, when you are doing it and doing it big, and you can take a cue from Mrs. Annie Mae Van Reed. And if her, oh, I wanted to mention too, in her lifetime, if we did the math now from her $60,000 in sales and plant sales to what it'd be now, it would be about $1.2 million. So she was essentially, in today's money, a self-made millionaire off of her work in horticulture and floriculture. This is another botanist uh, that's not talked about often. Um, and this is a woman named uh, Dora Atkins Powell Clark. Uh, or Dora Atkins Powell Blackburn, Dora Atkins Powell Blackburn. So this is a woman from Indianapolis, Indiana. So I've talked about people from the South, but I wanted to maybe spread it out a little bit. She is a woman whose mother started their floral shop in um, Indiana, and her father and her mother passed away within two years. She was very young as a teenager, and she decides to go to Butler College, which was then an HBCU. I think now it's a um, minority, majority HBCU and gets a degree in botany so she, she can better understand the plants that she is dealing with so that she can run this floral business. So imagine being a teenager and saying, I'm gonna get a botany degree, I'm gonna work the, uh, go to school during the day and work the florist shop at night, her and her sister. And she did that and she runs her shop in Indianapolis for 56 years. So even the longevity of working in these careers and what it has done um, with these 40, 50 year careers with the plants. She also traveled the country and went to many things, just like the symposium we are today, to keep her information and her knowledge fresh within her brain. So it's not just a Southern thing. These are black women in the Midwest and California all over that are using plants for their livelihood and doing quite well with that. Um, and the Atkins Flower Shop ended up being sold, I believe, in the 90s and passed on. But she has a very rich a legacy for her contributions to the city of Indianapolis, Indiana. And, you know, I wouldn't go into Houston and not mention Beyonce, so you know I am not <laughs> going to come into Durham, North Carolina, and not mention Mr. John Hope Franklin. So with that, um, it's interesting because my mom was a historian, and she ended up in her later life uh, having dementia, and one of the last people she told me about was John Hope Franklin's being an orchidist. And I always knew him for his research, his uh, you know, graduating from Harvard, being this legendary figure in black history and black research, but I didn't know that there was an orchid named after him and an orchid named after his wife, Aurelia, and them having this thousand orchid collection in Durham. So I repeat that, because there are some people here that are completely aware of that, and there's always somebody in the room, this is the first time they're hearing it. So uh, just the life and legacy of John Hope Franklin, and just his work, not even his work in black history, just his work as an orchidist is incredible. Um, the greenhouse, and I'm gonna give you the measurements here, of his uh, orchid house in Durham was 17 by 25 feet, which is very big for orchids only. And in 1976, it was in Chicago that the former president of the University of Chicago named the orchid after John Hope Franklin and also his wife, the two separate ones. And this is a white flower that is red in color, and it is also officially recognized by Britain's Royal Horticultural Society. So that is a very big deal to have him here um, in his greenhouse. And Dr. Hendricks and I were talking about, every, everybody I'm up here, I'm giving y'all like this fire hose rendition, but there can absolutely be a John Hope Franklin orchid book. I mean, literally, it could be that. So 
that is how rich our history is and how much has to be uncovered. My whole lifetime, we could never get through all these things. So uh, a fascinating uh, person that we have here. And also from North Carolina, Mr. Sylvester Owens, Mr. Sylvester Owens. So Mr. Owens, again, a legacy child of horticulture. He's born outside of Asheville and Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> he's born outside of Asheville. And with that, he makes his way to the Biltmore Estate as a chauffeur. He is the chauffeur for a gentleman named Chauncey Beadle, who is a legendary Canadian horticulturist who is hired to lay out the grounds at Biltmore. And with that, um, Cha Chauncey Beadle takes Sylvester Owens along with him. So when Chauncey Beadle passes away, Sylvester Owens is appointed as the head horticulturist of Biltmore in 1950. So he works there for over 30 years. He goes on to give lectures, tours. Uh, he is considered the Azalea King um, when his story is written in Ebony Magazine for his legacy and research in establishing the Azaleas that are out at Biltmore. Um, he's a pretty legendary figure. And when I share these stories, I never know who's gonna be in the room. So one time when I had Facebook, I don't anymore, I had posted about Sylvester Owens and my mom's best friend said, that's my grandmother's brother. So you just never know who knows. And what she told me was that when he passed away at the church in Asheville, you couldn't even get into church because flowers had come in from all over the world. So he was considered what was an azalea hunter. He would go around the South uh, with Chauncey Beadle and the others in their azalea crew and collect and do research on different type of Southern azaleas and native azaleas as well. So you just never know. We think of, oh, these people impacted locally, but we forget their international impact that they can have in the world of horticulture. And that was certainly the impact of Sylvester Owens. And there's a beautiful picture of him, I think also in the uh, Library of Congress where he's leaning, I don't know why I didn't show it to you today, but he's leaning out of his pickup truck. It's a color picture and his azaleas are all in the back. So super duper cool. And he passes away in 88, 89 is what Cheryl told me. So again, having a long life and legacy rich in the world of horticulture. And another North Carolina legend, J.W.R. Grandy, who is uh, the person who is responsible for establishing the first black landscape architecture program at a historically black college and university. This is the gentleman that you see on the left. Born in Windsor, North Carolina, he grew up on a family farm and had a deep interest in um, horticulture and design and also agriculture. So he goes to North Carolina A&T and then he goes to Cornell so that he can pursue an advanced degree in landscape architecture, but he comes back down south because his family is in fear of losing their farm. So he comes home, he's able to save the farm, but he has a deep interest in academia and teaching children about um, horticulture, landscape design, landscape architecture. So he goes on to teach at Southern University for many years and also at North Carolina A&T University. And, if anyone is here that goes to that school, I think I can confirm that there's the, the building is named after him uh, at the school as well. So uh, he also was superintendent of grounds at North Carolina A&T. And what I wanna show you here on the right about North Carolina A&T and their legendary horticulture program is their uh, poinsettia seal. So these are some of the black women that would grow the poinsettias in the floriculture program, the flower and horticulture program there. And this went on for decades and decades and decades. I'm not sure that it still goes on as well, but um, a lot of times we're not, you know, it's not just us growing cut flowers, it's us growing these potted plants. And North Carolina really having a legacy of black women leaving there and, and becoming professional floriculturists um, is incredible for American and telling the American garden history story. Now, I talked about Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina being part of this trifecta. And with that, um, in Virginia, and this, the people here, two of them have been mentioned today, so I want to point them out because it's important to put a name to a face. Asa Sims, who we talked about um, as one of the people who helped found the North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs. This is him in the red. In the middle uh, here to the right in the green glasses, that is a gentleman named P.J. Chesson, Purvis J. Chesson, who was an educator in Virginia. And then William Cooper, who was the other, uh, one of the people who helped establish the North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs. This is William Cooper here on the right uh, in the purple. And the woman who's in the middle is a woman named Ethel Early Clark. And these are the four people who founded what was then called the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. So they were founded in 1932. In 2022, I was fortunate enough to join Sean Spencer Hester and some other 
uh, women who celebrated the 90th anniversary of what was then the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. But 1935, Asa Sims, William Cooper come down to North Carolina and recreate that. So federated clubs mean these are clubs that have their own constitution, their own independence, their own symposiums, their own everything separated of the, the Garden Club of Virginia, so separate of the white clubs. And these, obviously, y'all's is still going, thriving. With the Garden Clubs of Virginia, they were actively meeting up into the early 2000s, but the work that they've done cannot be discounted. And what I mean by that is these are women who were organizing people to vote. They were, um, we talked about that um, earlier on the panel where they talked about black women and the civil um, rights attachment and, and uh, to horticulture. And I say that because outside of the NAACP and outside of the black church, the most organized group were black women in garden clubs. And that's why they were able to have such a rich impact in their communities. Um, they did food drives, seed distributions, they had contests. Um, so this wasn't just, you know, finger sandwiches and sweet tea. This was a real, and, and still is a way and a means of how beautification is done and has been done in black communities for a very long time. And these clubs aren't just in North Carolina or South Carolina or Virginia. They're, they didn't just start in the 1930s. There is uh, evidence and research, I've seen it, of black garden clubs at some of these HBCUs like Tuskegee in the 1800s, the late 1800s, the 1880s to be exact. So clubs have been going on for a very long time. So don't let the word club just di be dismissive to you as something social. Clubs are very serious and very impactful in what they do in these black communities. This particular club was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So the mighty Midwest were back there. This is a woman named uh, Artie Halyard here, but this is a woman named Mrs. William Roberson. I've had a hard time trying to find her first name. I've looked and looked and looked, haven't been able to find it even in the census. But what I want to point out here, in 1949, she wins 11 ribbons at the Wisconsin State Fair based on the plants that she's growing, the food that she's growing, and also uh, the flowers that she's growing. So four of these are blue ribbons. So even the state fairs are fair game to look at our accomplishments and what we've done. That is a very big deal to have won 11 ribbons in the state fair of Wisconsin uh, during that time. And this is the town and country garden club, a very famous black garden club in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Then we have uh, garden clubs in places like Mississippi. So I just wanted to show specifically to the women of the Federated Garden Clubs of North Carolina, your sisterhood, it, it is long, it is strong, it goes all over the United States and y'all are part of such a wonderful, wonderful legacy and we thank you for that. Um, so this is the uh, Pike County Garden Club in um, Macomb, Mississippi. This is, I, I'm telling y'all this story really because I love saying these names, Mrs. Eula Mae Fortenberry <laughs> and Mrs. Missouri Tobias, which some good old country Mississippi names, I love it. And with that, they have their own club. And I don't know what was going on in Macomb, Mississippi, but they were uh, a big deal down there. This, uh, they had 39 exhibitions um, with their garden club that day. And these were some of the, the big ribbon winners. So just the sisterhood, the excitement, the collectivity, this made the, the big papers in Mississippi, uh, the Macomb, uh, Mississippi Garden Club. So I wanted to share that specifically with you ladies. And of course, um, I wanted to show this picture that Carter Q graciously sent me of Mady Hall Zuma in her garden as well for the people who have known maybe the story but not necessarily have ever seen her. So this is her and her beautiful garden in North Carolina. And she, again, just as a reminder, it was mentioned earlier and it's mentioned in the text today, but was the president, the first president of the North Carolina Federation of Garden Clubs. So her picture and then Asa Sims, who we'll see again, but not necessarily his face as clearly, and William Cooper. So again, putting those names to a face. So back to Mr. Asa Sims. This picture is taken from Hampton University, from their archives, and with that, Asa Sims uh, put together, I mean, honestly dedicated his lifetime to horticulture. This is a gentleman, a native of Asheville, North Carolina, was working in a barber shop doing shoe shine, and someone mentioned to him, you should go to Hampton University. And his intention was to go to Hampton University to be an artist because he wanted to paint. But when he got to Hampton, he was hired to work in the greenhouse as his student job. And he soon realized, I don't have to paint pictures with paint. I can plant my pictures with flowers and plants. And so he dedicates his life to horticulture. And I really mean he dedicates his life to it. 
I'm an Ace of Seam super fan, no doubt. And with that, in Enfield, North Carolina, at the Brick School, this is a, uh, a two-week program that Ace of Sims puts together because we can never forget the contributions of rural America to garden design. And you can see it's business out here. He's got his loppers in his hand. Uh, the group is here ready. And this is how the reporter, who stays with this class to document this exciting work being done in Enfield. He says he is as intelligent as he is enthusiastic as informing as he is talkative and as inspiring as he is gracious. His class ranges in age from 18 to 70. So even just the multi-generational aspect of these garden classes. Here in this picture, Asa Sims is again here. He's, uh, the class is in range from 18 to 70. And I'll show you the group photo at the end. Um, here he's talking to the class and the reporter says that these are the questions he's asking. What do you suggest for this place? How would you arrange the driveway? What do you think of the trees? Should any of them be cut down? Would you leave that one there as a windbreak? Would you leave that one there as a windbreak to, to slow the wind down? In a semicircle, we stand asking and answering questions and making suggestions. So I wanted to share that part of the documentation with you because I wanted to talk about the intellectual conversation that is being had discussing a windbreak. These aren't willy-nilly, should we plant a tree? These are highly educated, highly thoughtful decisions being made in these rural areas by black people. And again, black women, I love her with her hands on her hips first in the class. You know she has an opinion for sure <laughs> on whether there should be a windbreak there or not. So absolutely. Uh, very, very cool. And, and this part too, and I want, this is, uh, I think, important to say. Um, with his work, he was very big, make use of the things around you. That was one of his quotes. So when you see that there, that is uh, what that's referencing. When you see these quotes today, these are all things that were either said by that person or said about them. He has on this chalkboard, it's very hard to see. These are old, old pictures, by the way. Y'all did the best I can. What it says on his chalkboard are four things. Thy kingdom come on earth make use of the things around you, an appreciation for the beautiful, and cultural values make for a finer living. So with that, in black communities, it's not just the art and science of horticulture, it's the art and the science and the spirit of horticulture. So when you feel it in you, you don't ever have to let someone take that away from you. It's something that's unexplainable sometimes, the connection to the land. So that is not something we have to shrink or hide or diminish. You can, it, it is a spirit of horticulture and our ancestors they just outright said it. And I'm not, you know, this isn't about like religious views, it's just about that connection, that unexplainable connection to the land that we have. And Asa Sims felt free to express that in his North Carolina classroom. And this is the, the class picture I wanted to show y'all. This is, uh, I think I counted one day, and I'm gonna flip so we can, uh, I can end at, at three, but there were, I believe, 17 or 16 women in the class and four or five men. So a majority, again, the women showing up for this two-week uh, course in horticulture uh, led by Asa Sims. And also, we were talking about um, rural garden designs, not rural garden designs, but black garden designs. This is a picture that was documented through Asa Sims' work in Enfield, North Carolina. And this is a black woman sitting in her garden, again, proud, her hat is in her lap. She is ready for this beautiful picture. We would call this a rockery in the design world. Um, she has used a palette here to uh, elevate your eye. So that was very intentional. That's not just a palette turned to the side. It's to lift your eye like a, like a skyline. That's what she's created. And this is some of the dialogue that was had in her gardening class. It says, we turn to the Bible for help and other great books. We have ideas of our own, which often we are afraid to tell others because we think we are so different. No one needs to be afraid of anyone else. We rejoice over differences and call no one peculiar. We try to make order, symmetry, beauty, harmony, and loveliness. We talk about beauty in life and loveliness in character. Worship takes on new meaning because life itself becomes more meaningful. And that is what black gardens have done for these communities. And again, it's, it's not imaginary. Ann Spencer, her emphasis on beauty, and these black women in Enfield saying, we talk much about beauty and life. So again, that quality of life issue, that thread there. Another colleague of Asa Sims, this is Dr. Harold Hamilton Williams, who was also a professor at North Carolina A&T, was the first academic to 
document black landscapes in the South as something separate and something special that is different from just European garden design or Japanese garden design or American garden design. And though some of his words are critical, the fact that he understood it to be its own special art form uh, must be acknowledged and addressed. And this is a copy of his thesis uh, called Suggested Plan and Procedures for a Study of Landscapes in Negro Communities of the Southern States. So with this, he goes on a 10,000 mile survey from uh, Georgia to Alabama to North Carolina to South Carolina to Virginia, and I believe also Tennessee is in there, and he documents 10,000 miles on a road trip over a two year period, these black gardens that he is finding in the South. And these are a few of the words from his thesis. He says, by racial heritage, a people of the outdoors, the American Negro has been introduced to living mainly indoors through landscaping he can be restored to his out of door living. So he understood that he was seeing a shift with black people starting to not uh, want to be as involved in maybe beautification or agrarian work and losing that skill set. So he was very adamant that we needed to research this and perhaps preserve it. And this was one of his observations in the South. He said, practically every Negro home in the South, especially, has some ornamental planting about it. An herb may be carefully nursed in a tin can or a clump of flowers cultivated in a flower bed outlined by a discarded automobile tire. And we've all certainly seen that tire edging, that paint, the, the rocks painted. And with these landscapes, it's not, um, it's a choice. You don't have to like it, but I think we all have an obligation to understand it at its own special art form. These are designs that are not built for the viewer. Most landscape designs are, most garden designs are built for the audience. These black gardens that Dr. H. Hamilton Williams, Dr. Harold Hamilton Williams was documenting were designed for the owner, for the inhabitant of that garden. So separating and creating your own beauty and not caring what other people think, you have that right too. And that is something that is very special about black gardens. <laughs> like, <laughs> so with that, I wanted to um, close out with a description of a black garden that was found in House Beautiful magazine in May of 1933. So House Beautiful is still a publication today. And this was written by a white woman named Martha Fisher. This is the actual cover. I have the magazine at home. And she calls it unique garden decoration. And what she says is this. Um, she starts off the article, I'm going to be honest, very critical of these black gardens. But they're so fascinating to her that they are something that she documents. It is approved by an editor. It makes into this garden publication. She says, to find this garden of great interest in its fullest development, one must go south of the Mason-Dixon line. Once there, one must forsake one's natural background and penetrate into these regions across the railroad track. So she's saying, I have to go into the black neighborhood. So basically, that's what she did. <laughs> she said, they are regions of strong rhythms, rhythms of music the day and night long. Definitely in the black neighborhood, all the music. <laughs> so here is just a collage I put together. But what I'm going to do, we talked about with Sean, hers being the only restored black garden. So where we may not have pictures. and. I say we may not have them, they, they exist. They exist in somebody's attic, your grandmama, your aunties, because I'm going through my own parents' archives. I have stunning pictures of what their landscape looks like on their farm in the 1940s, 1950s. So it's not that we don't know, we, we have to look and we have them in our own basements and in our own attics. She says this about the gardens, in them sunshine yellow and tobacco brown of sunflowers are juxtaposed with excellent, if unconscious effect, to the faded pink of bouncing bet. The searing orange of marigolds burns simultaneously against the bludgeoning purple of clematis or the murky red of coxcomb. So we know what the combination was and we know what the layout was and that is how we are able to uh, have clues on what black people were planning and how they were planning them. She says, the fern-like fronds of tansy foliage rear in relief against the sharply outlined broad spearheads of tobacco leaves. Now we wouldn't plant today a tobacco plant in a garden, but this could have easily been a garden in North Carolina, because back then, they would have done that. That would have been a plant that they were working around in the fields. She described the, the, the garden as this. The feathery green of the yopon droops on a background of the splayed bronze fans of the castor bean leaves. Descendants of the aristocratic flower denizens of the garden, of the big house, rub branches with the utilitarian tomato plant or creepers of the yam, which no doubt found their way into this humble milieu in the shape of seeds and cuttings 
carried from the scene of the day's labor in the basket that is the inseparable appendage of every black arm in domestic service. So what she's saying is what, what she has observed is black people bringing these tomato plants and planting them against their potato plants and planting them with the roses in the way that William Lanier Hunt said, these are black people who are taking these cuttings and bringing them back home at the end of the day. So she's reaffirming what he goes on to research. The service workers, the nannies, the maids, the, the gentlemen who are gardening, bringing these plants back and creating their own garden design in their gardens. It says, but yet, she's, she's stunned by these gardens. She says, yet the planting, interesting as it is, is not the apex of achievement of this garden we are discussing. The distinctive feature of this garden is an item whose strong eligibility for a place in the believe it or not column of the daily news sheet will remain unchallenged. She says this unique form of decoration borders paths of dirt, crushed shell, or cinders. It forms geometric and naturalistic designs in advantageous spots. It is the focal point in many of a flower arrangement. The pyramid of glass in porcelain, it is to them what the central fountain or main group of statuary is to the landscape artist's formal garden scheme. So what she's seeing are broken plates, broken pieces of pottery used as edging and used as a focal point and a centerpiece in these black gardens. So it's not just food recipes we lose, we lose garden recipes as well. And when we think about black people having to assimilate into America and look a certain way, dress a certain way, talk a certain way, enunciate, we also lost what our gardens look like as well to make sure that we fit into society. She says, is there any other type of garden in which broken glass and china play a leading role, not to my knowledge, in this United States of ours? So the only illustration that was in that article, and this is a pretty long detailed description, is the artist drew these, the flower beds with the handleless teacup pots that this particular uh, black gardener had used in their garden. Can you imagine how stunning this must have been uh, with that flower mixture I described and the fact that they were able to illustrate of that one section of the garden that was bordered by the handleless teacups. She said that there were heart-shaped beds in this garden um, of, of teacups and that there is beauty in these gardens. So where she starts off criticizing the black landscapes and how she has to go to the black side of town, at the end of the article, she acknowledges there is beauty in these gardens. So beautiful, it's something she's never seen. She's seeing it throughout the South and she sees that it must be documented. So with that, I want to end this presentation uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, at the beautiful Wing Haven, uh, made famous by Elizabeth Lawrence, certainly one of the grand dames of Southern horticulture. And she acknowledges, this is her quote, I could never have made a new garden without the help of Willie. This is Willie Calloway, who was her head gardener and who helped Elizabeth, Garden take, I mean, Elizabeth Lawrence take nothing from her as a stellar horticulturist. And also her understanding to acknowledge it is Willie it is his hands, his educated hands, connected to his educated mind in that dirt, creating the beautiful gardens that we see today, such as Wing Haven. So there's only one thought I wanna leave y'all with today, and that is, we ain't new to this, we are true to this, we've been doing this. So, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> so I encourage you, whether you wanna be an orchidist like John Hope Franklin, whether you wanna be flex on everybody, uh, like Annie Mae Van Reed, whether you want to be somebody like Peyton DeWitt cultivating and building your own 100-foot greenhouses, or you want to be an educator, such as the incredible, the incredible Asa Sims, I hope you find your way, pursue your way in horticulture, in agriculture, in floriculture, and see that we have done so, so many things. So with that, I thank y'all, and I must also specially thank Kavana from Duke Gardens, and then also uh, Carter Q for everything that you've done to bring this legendary symposium together. Y'all, right, we're in a historical moment. There's somebody, somebody that researches this 50 years from now and presents it on stage as well. So thank y'all for being here, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvester. And I, do you do we have time for you want to take the questions outside? It, okay.
We have a question. We'll start here. We have this. Um, hi. Thank you so much. That was just, that was everything. <laughs> Thank you. We, we are everything. We're really about that everything. life. I love it. But um, I was really uh, intrigued by that last uh, part of your presentation where you're talking about the teacups in the garden is sort of like, and I'm wondering if anybody has done any work on, you know, the use of crockery, you know, because I'm from Charleston, you know, Gullah Geechee territory, and people decorate their graves with, in that same manner, with broken crockery, with, you know, household items, with, I was wondering if anybody has done any work on exploring that spiritual connection between the grave decoration practices and how that, um, how that, you know, plays into the gardens. There, there is, I have not, I, I can't say that there's a book on black grave decorations, but I have done research on it and seen the articles where the grave decorations in Charleston are different from the ones in Alabama, where they may be painted white and that may be a connection to the river forest boundary to reflect the water. And they may be edged in oyster um, parts where in Alabama, it may be a clock that's left with the time of death on there. So. It is not monolithic how black people um, decorate their graves and decorate it in a celebratory way because in that exchange and with that decoration, the, answer, the relationship is continuing. It's not something that grandmama's in the ground, she's gone, it, it, it's still active there. So when I talk about less lost recipes, you're in cemeteries and I was like, oh, you can't leave that, can't do that, don't want anybody looking at me. But those are things that, you know, these are the ancestors waking us up and saying, you can, you can, Talk to me, you can decorate, you can, that's because that's what they would have done. And those are things that we aren't doing anymore. So we have the right to, to, to have a renaissance and, and do those things. So thank you for bringing that up. I, I didn't include that, but I have a beautiful picture of some black graves um, in Charleston. Before we take the next question from upstairs, I definitely want to uh, not let this go unsaid, it brought to my attention. We have the interpreter network that's been doing the American Sign Language all day, without complaint, without hesitation, please. Yes. <laughs> is there a question from upstairs? There is. I, no? OK. I don't think so. I think okay, I just saw the microphone. It's a light shining in my eyes, y'all, so that's why I, I thought it might be. So you mentioned South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, mm -hmm. and I harbor from that other up south locale, Washington, D.C. And more specifically, I was just wondering if any of your research carried you into D.C., and more specifically, that oasis that most people don't know about or have ever visited, but I grew up right around the corner which is the federal government's location mm -hmm. for researching ornamental plants, which is the National Arboretum. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there was a black presence there or participation or how any of these other grand horticulturists may have engaged it, but what's its significance in any and all of this? There is a black significance there. And if you had not asked this question, I would say this man's name like that. I can't believe I'm forgetting it right now, but um, the cherry trees that are along the National Monument. It was a black man that went to Howard University. And he saw them declining, the trees that were planted during the Taft administration, a botanist, a black botanist. Um, I feel so bad I can see his face. He was so famous with his work in that he was like considered a celebrity in Japan. And with the, he passed away recently, like maybe 2021, 2022, but he worked at the National Arboretum. And so he started off just making the signs. He had a botany degree from Howard, but they weren't really looking at his intellectualism, but then when he was uh, able to do that research on the cherry trees, they started seeing how brilliant he was, and, and he wrote books about it as well. Um, I will tell you when, when the question's over, I'm gonna pull his name up in my phone. So yes, there is a present there. Um, and then somebody has his name? Okay. Oh, oh okay, okay, it's a question. So with that, um, there's that part. We have a question right here. Okay. So I have his name, it's uh, Roland Maurice Jackson. Thank you. Roland Jefferson, thank you. Roland Maurice Jefferson. So an incredible legacy just with him and the cherry trees. And then also women, Georgia Douglas Johnson was mentioned with her roses earlier today with Noel. Um, just the women there in that area, in those garden clubs, um, having uh, a huge presence. And then women doing flowers for the White House, things like that, uh, during many of the administrations during the 40s, 50s, 60s. So yes, thank you for your 
your question. And thank you for finding Roland Jefferson for me. Yes, here we are. There's one upstairs, and then I'll come to you. Yes, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my question is really going back to your thoughts about you know, revisiting a potential renaissance when we live in a world where right now there's limited land ownership. In my generation, people are renting. People are still also trying to understand what a connection to plants mean to them. So in, in your opinion, how do you see something like that evolving where maybe there was a significance in people um, edging with different things that were symbolic in their home, something that they could continue on for generations when we live in a world where we're quite secular and, and continually moving over time? My thoughts on that are black culture in America has always moved the culture forward. So even though it can look like the darkest of days right now, that is how we got Negro spirituals and jazz music and hip hop and soul food. So I don't have the answer to um, where now there is um, a bigger renter population versus land ownership. But I do believe that garden design, gardening, all of these things will still move forward in a new way. And I don't know what that way is because we're in the process of figuring that out in real time. And land ownership is hard. I live on a big lot in Atlanta. I live on my family, the, the house I grew up in, I live there. And it is, I say big lot, it's 1.8 acres in the city. And it is kicking my butt, I ain't even gonna lie. It is hard, it is just me there, right? Where in the past there are black families living in black communities in all black neighborhoods and it's more of a community project led oftentimes by garden clubs. So um, we have to, we're gonna have to work together if we're gonna do these things. It can't be this independent, do it on your own. The, the generosity, the knowledge of people like Asa Sims and the Garden Club women and H. Hamilton Williams, who you saw, we have, to, we have to find a way to work together. And I don't know what that way is. I don't know if, I, obviously we all know that social media has impacted that, but, um, and I think that the answer to your question exists in this room today, like coming together in community and having moments like this help us make connections that we need to be able to, to do those projects moving forward. So I think it's a to be continued <laughs> is my response to you. I'm sorry I don't have a better answer. Thank you. Okay, um, Gloria Phoenix. I found that um, trying to research how many of these garden clubs, including the Federation, were uh, documented in the National Archives. Uh, I can't even find it documented in the state archives. So I'm up against the fact that they did organize and they did organize for the state, but they, and they had to uh, go through, you know, a time of Jim Crow where they were actually kept from having a separate club, but they then did finally get it organized through A&T. But um, so this is the thing I'm, I'm uh, asking about the formal recognition. And this is also connected, not to just the floor clubs, but also the uh, undocumented graves throughout North Carolina, Virginia, and Georgia. Mm -hmm. We want to add Mississippi and Alabama, you can. But uh, so that's one of the questions. How many uh, did you find were actually documented? Oh, all of the, w the reason I know this is because we documented it for ourselves, for our communities on our own. In, in Asa Sims in his lifetime, he wasn't maybe necessarily thinking about what the National Archives was doing or the Garden Club of Virginia. So um, it is about, Sean Spencer Hester and I talk about this a lot, writing our own story and saving our own story and taking our own pictures of our own story because no one's going to protect that or save that but us. So it, it is on us to do that. And, and even moments like this where I say, this, we really are in a historical moment. They didn't know that in 2024, we, we would be discussing their life and legacy, but they knew they were doing something that was important to their community. So we just have to continue to, to protect our own culture and be the voice for our own culture. And if it doesn't make it to the National Archives, we still got our stories, we got it. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't lose sleep over that. I used to think about it and wonder, and now I'm like, I don't care, it's, we have it. It's, I, even when I read letters that my grandmama was writing back to the farm in Barnesville, she's like, Oh, mama, I got the potatoes you sent me. H. Hamilton Williams is writing letters to his mother describing in detail the Rose Parade in Pasadena. So that is how we document it. We, 
we can't depend on we all we got that's the answer to that. we literally are all we got so just keep doing what you're doing and document that rich wonderful legacy we have a question over here okay oh. how did the people that sold the flowers how did they stay safe because i'm pretty sure they like you know had some violence against them right no that I, I've never seen where it was physical violence against them. What, what I have saw in my research was there were arrests. So there's a time they're just thriving, doing their thing. And then when you're competing as a flower seller, bringing your things in, in your little buckets, you know, through your horse or walking it down versus someone who has a flower shop with their permit and all that other stuff. And then they call the city and say, hey, this person doesn't have a permit. And so they're pushed off of these streets, but they can't own any land. They can't get the permit. They you know, don't have a say in the city government because they don't necessarily have the right to vote. So it's the classic example of moving the finish line, right? They got too successful for their own good is what happened. Um, so I never saw uh, any, and I'm not saying it didn't happen, but it was just more so they're not following the rules. They're just out here selling flowers. I paid my permit. And that is when that all fell apart. But the history of black people and flower vendors, I mean, rich, long Harlem, you know, uh, Seattle, uh, Pasadena, that was a thing, a real thing for us. And not just uh, women, black men, black people were doing that. So we can, we can always return to it as well, and we are. I see a, there's a huge, there's a association called Black Girl Floor. So there are a lot of black flower vendors that have uh, reinvented themselves and reignited that in today's world. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question over here. Okay, so with, I've heard about century farming, century farms. Um, how does that relate into like, um, I know like some of the um, century farms, is that registered in the archives of farms that has been passed down for centuries because that's the process of being a century farm? I, I will own, I don't know much about century farms. I'm not even sure if I've heard that term I, and I'm not sure if that's the same thing as an heirs property and again that kind of speaks to the range and richness of black people in horticulture my background is like deeply ornamental horticulture I can talk about the camellias the roses the cherry trees I couldn't really tell you much about that but if it relates to heirs prop I'm in that situation now with my cousins and when my aunt Lois passed the my grandmother's sister she was the sole heir to this 27 acres in Barnesville now she passed and it ended up being in the hands of the grandchildren who was my mama and her cousins. My mama passed, now three of us, we've moved up in line. So we, got, we went from one descendant to almost 17 people who got to figure out what to do with this piece of land. And it is, it's a mess. So that is what happens to black families. It's not written in paper and nobody, the assumption is, oh, well it was just always, we discussed it, we got to write it down and have an attorney to spell out what it's gonna be because our land is just sitting there dying, it's sad and I'm living it, and it, it, it infuriates me, to be honest. Okay, so is it better, like, because we've heard about a trust on land, and stuff like, for instance, with our farm, we have a descendant of a acre. Yeah. I think it's wonderful, but I gotta get my other 16 cousins and my two siblings to be on the same page. That's the problem, like it has to be, and then that's multi-generational. So it's, it's just a tangled, knotted mess that I don't have. So we either gonna keep it for nothing or we're gonna lose it for nothing. And none of us paid for a dime of this land. My great grandparents bought this in the 30s. You see what I mean? So it's, yeah. Right. And that's certainly a discussion worth having. So hopefully the symposium will continue and maybe yearly or biannually and that could be a very real topic because that's very real for a lot of black families, including mine. And it happens overnight, y'all. My mama passed, bam, just like that. I'm part of, 
I couldn't say nothing about this land for 44 years of my life. And then the day she dies, now because they want my taxes. That, that's the, the cousins will hit you up and be like, send your taxes in. Yes, that's how I knew I was in it. Yeah. <laughs> if we don't have any more questions upstairs, we have one last question down here. But before we do that, let's acknowledge the other half of the Interpreter Network, ASL. <laughs> Specifically regarding ornamental horticulture, um, I noticed that the majority of your presentation focuses on black women, mm -hmm. with an exception of Franklin. Um, do you find that today that has changed, probably due to um, a change shift in gender roles, um, and maybe that's the reason why um, your presentation was focused on mostly black women? Do, so do you mean, do I find this change meaning black women in these roles per se, or? Well, mostly black women being a part of like selling flowers and um, the I, horticulture in that way. Yeah, I think that what it is, we're, I think we're more dispersed now. So it's not that I didn't know or see black women in horticulture. It's just that we're doing different roles and we're not living, these people were in commun literally living in the same communities. So it's easier to capture that. Where now I'm in Atlanta and one of the black women I know that is, is an arborist lives in Athens. We're not living in the same neighborhoods, you know, going to the same schools, that type of thing. So it's not that it doesn't exist. It, it actually definitely does exist. Um, and I'll tell you this, when I was an arborist for the city of Atlanta, that was like my first real job out of college, there were five black arborists that worked for the city of Atlanta. Four of them went to HBCUs and had uh, advanced degrees. I was the only one that went to the predominantly white institution, no master's degree. So uh, and they all went to Southern and Tuskegee. So these roles are out there. We're just in different parts. Now, it's not like that now. One of those arborists lives in Louisiana. Another one lives in Seattle. So the dispersion of everything for, for various reasons. So um, yeah, but black women, we've, I didn't even, I talked about ornamental horticulture a lot. I mean, we didn't talk about black women being uh, writing garden columns, <laughs> you know, things like that. There's so much stuff, being entomological artists, insect artists, I mean, Literally, we do, we ain't new to this. I really mean that, <laughs> like for real, for real. So yeah, we're in a lot of roles. Black people, period, are. Up here. Okay. Thank oh, you. thank you. I have more of a comment also. First of all, I grew up in rural Warren County and I saw a lot of these things. I actually saw the recycling before there was recycling. And one thing I would like to add and I really appreciate now is the fact that my ancestors, they cared about the land. They knew the land took care of us, so we took care of it. So our spiritual connection, even to climate change, was there. I saw that then in my ancestors, that they cared about the earth. If I had been living in Durham, mm -hmm. I probably would, have, would not have made it. But being in rural Warren County with all that garden, that non-processed food, mm -hmm. fresh food, kept my ancestors alive way past what longevity was. So I appreciate that they also cared about the land and they knew the land took care of us and they really had that concept of climate control or what would happen if we don't take care of this earth, this beautiful soil that we are given. So I really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Let's give, thank you. Thank you, Abra. Let's give her a hand for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all. Next, we're going to have closing remarks from Angela Lee. Thank you, Kavana. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Angela Lee, the executive director here at the Haytai Heritage Center, and I'm so honored that we were able to have you all here for this wonderful, amazing symposium today. Kavana, Carter, you all really brought it. You continue to honor the excellence of our elders and our ancestors, the legacy, the history of horticulture and gardening, which is so critical for all of us, especially in these days. I'll say this one thing that wasn't said before. The space that you all are sitting in right now opened in 1891 as St. Joseph's African Methodist Episcopal Church. 
And I feel the spirit of the ancestors and the elders every time I'm in here. But before the brick and mortar opened in 1869, the congregation worshiped on this site under a brush arbor. So the spirit and the history of horticulture, gardening, everything, it's, it's connected. We're all connected. And all of you here today are now part of Haiti's history. What we've witnessed and what we've learned today has not only informed us of our history, our past, and it impacts our present, but goodness knows it will sustain us in the future for generations to come. So thank you all again, everyone who participated in bringing this amazing symposium to the Haiti Heritage Center, our speakers, our interpreters, our sponsors, um, everyone who was a part of making this happen, the Federation, and again, Carter, thank you so much for bringing this vision and this reality to the Haiti Heritage Center. And let's all go out and plant something, grow something. Thank you again. Bye-bye.